Welcome everybody. We are now just waiting for the participants to join. So we will start shortly. Looks like we're getting quite a few jumps joining on if we want to go ahead and get started. People stopped raising their hands already. <laughs> hi, Tim. Tim, hi, Tim. Uh, hi, Tim. Hello. Good. Scott is here. Laura is here. Good, good. We have the first peak lineups. We have Laura. Excellent. Yeah, here. Getting us up on Facebook now. So, really, okay. are you trying to? Uh, Share it with Facebook? Yes, I'm just connecting the stream now. It's almost right. ready. Good. Hey, cheese for the camera, please. All right. Do we want to let Jason go ahead and get started? Ready if you guys are. OK. Go for it. All right, let's get the screen share up. And I'm going to do a quick deck. For everyone, got 10 minutes running on the clock, so don't <laughs> delay anybody else today. What a great crowd you have for this, Caroline. Thanks for pulling this together. I'm really excited to share with everyone. Um, this deck comes from our weekly office hours that we've been doing, where we've been helping a lot of brands pivot their content. Uh, and the main thing that we're focusing on is helping people kind of uh, get over these current challenges, these current unknowns, where they don't know what to say on social, where they don't know what the tone of voice should be, where they don't know what type of content they need to be posting out compared to two, three months ago, right? Um, so this is what typically I would be doing in one of our physical conferences. I love a t-shirt gun. Uh, any chance to shoot one off is my favorite time of our events. Uh, you can see the scared staffer there behind me in this photo. And we don't get to do this right now. We're, we're pushing our physical conference and we're pivoting our uh, business to a digital event to a virtual conference, Social Fresh X. Um, so we've been facing these same challenges and I've been facing a ton, we've been helping a ton of businesses from plumbing companies to RV rental companies to hotels, um, all these companies that are facing very unique challenges. I love this chart. This is uh, from early March. This is searches for coronavirus on google.com. And the reason I'm comparing it to Facebook is because Facebook is the most searched word on Google for all of 2019. And in this chart, you can see coronavirus at, at its peak was approaching uh, eight times that volume, eight times the most searched word of all of 2019. Uh, to even find a single word that approaches the volume of coronavirus being searched in Google in March, you have to use the most popular word in the English language, the, um, and even then coronavirus was being used more often. Uh, so what does this tell us? Um, this is the peak relative to today. The volume has declined quite a bit. The interest in just the word coronavirus has declined as people understand what it is. They're now searching for more how-to content, more of a new normal. And my thing is attention has changed dramatically. The way we spend our hours in the day has changed dramatically. Where we're putting that attention, where we're watching content, how we're watching content, how we're consuming social media posts. Uh, yes, we're, we're kind of approaching a new normal and we have a lot of data to tell us what that looks like, uh, but it's still new. It's still not what it was. So we have to adjust, we have to adjust our tone and our content. Um, so I love this from Google. They said the word normal is at an all time high being searched and it's not just the word normal, but people searching for a new normal, when things get back to normal, uh, when are, you know, when are, when a job search is going to be normal again, when are, when are my finances going to be normal again? In general, I think this is a great place to think about, uh, because one thing that every business should be talking to the, their audience about right now is how they can help them find a new normal. Um, and I know that new normal is kind of a vague term, but just think about what, how people are spending their day, how people are spending their hours, their money right now, and how can you be a part of that in a helpful and supportive way? 
So we've talked about maybe 30, 40 sub uh, subtopics when it comes to that. The three that I think are the most applicable for, for the broadest range of businesses are these three. And that would be the trend of how your business can get into the home if you're not already. Uh, virtual, obviously, what we're doing today and distractions. And I'm going to jump into each of those and give a little bit more info on each. So when it comes to in-home, uh, this is a very complicated chart. You don't need to understand what this is, but the black line, the black dotted line is when uh, in the U.S. Uh, people started receiving uh, restaurant closings in their states, right? And the orange line is where people stopped going to restaurants. This is data um, from restaurant reservations, so open table. And what it shows you is that people stopped going to restaurants before it was illegal, before it was against local laws, before it was mandated. They stopped going 10 to 20 days before that. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because the same thing is going to happen as in the U.S. states start opening up and other countries as businesses get back to normal. People are still going to go it on their own terms. They're still going to make their own decisions. So this, this uh, survey from ABC, uh, show, I'm sorry, CBS News Poll, shows us that we uh, are, are very reluctant, even if it's going to be allowed to go into a restaurant, to get on an airplane, or go to a large event. 70% uh, or more are re really reluctant to go into a restaurant, 85% to get on an airplane. Uh, so what does this tell us? This says, tells us that the in-home trend is here to stay for months, at least, in the U.S., meaning if, if you're not figuring out a way that you can participate in the in-home environment, whether that's people are cooking more, people are um, doing homeschooling for the first time and getting very confused by that. People's schedules are completely changed. You really have to adapt to that new normal of people being in an in-home environment much more as a much longer part of their day. So an example here from Barbie, early on uh, the Mattel team uh, was, was doing a lot of content with really good tone. We know there is a lot going on. They're not mentioning coronavirus. They're not saying, you know, in these trying times, a lot of very common phrases. What they're focusing on is what would you like to see from us? They're literally asking their audience what would be helpful. And one of the most popular things was these in-home activities, coloring books that they've done before uh, from Barbie, but they haven't done on the scale and they haven't done as often. These are printables, things that they can download for their kids to create in-home activities. I think this is very interactive. I think it's a really great way for a brand to participate um, digitally, but also in a printout mode. Uh, HP is doing stuff like this as well. It's really unique and a fun way to get inside of the home and, and on trend. Um, this is a little more of an outlier from uh, Arby's. We saw this uh, from Heinz. We've seen it from a few brands, which is making puzzles, sometimes really ridiculously hard puzzles uh, that people can order and put together in their home. Uh, this is fun. It's a little quirky, but think about things like that. Sport games, um, you know, cooking routines, recipes, things like that. These are easy ways, easy things that a lot of brands can tap into. Another example, uh, Double Tree has a famous cookie that they give you when you check in and they release that recipe for the first time so people could cook it at home. All right, virtual. Uh, video group calling up 1,000% in the last month on Facebook. This is just on Facebook. Obviously, it's up everywhere. Um, I think that's an amazing stat. Um, what can you do virtually that's not just a webinar, that's not just, you know, if you're doing training like we are today, this is a great format, but if you're, you know, most businesses are not training businesses, the webinars don't necessarily work for them. Um, this is from Murray's Cheese, a famous cheese shop in New York. They did these cheese kits that you could order, they get shipped to you a week or two before your class and you do a cheese tasting at home, live through Zoom, but with a ton of other people to have the exact same cheeses that they ordered from Murray's as well. Really interactive, got them a lot of social response. Uh, this is a famous example by now. I wouldn't be shocked if we hear about this a couple of times today, but the goat to meeting where you could get a goat or a llama on your Zoom meeting. Here we have a, a, a llama here at the bottom row. Uh, this is quirky. This is silly, but you can pay $100 to get a llama. And this became so popular, they, they could not fulfill all the um, requests they had for it. They had to go out to other farms and other um, uh, rescue farms for farm animals across the country. And now I think there's over a hundred farms doing this because the demand is so high to get a silly animal into your Zoom meeting. Uh, so these farms are bringing in extra revenue right now. Okay, and then the third one, distraction to close this out. Um, really interesting stats coming out of Spotify. Music is very popular right now, but it's, it's not popular just in the drive time when people are commuting to work and in the evenings when they're at home. It's popular all day, every day. We're also seeing this with e-commerce. Um, 
It used to be people would shop online in the mornings and in the evenings. Now they're shopping online all day. It's a static line. Every hour of the day is pretty comparable. Uh, another stat from uh, Spotify that I thought was really interesting is that people were searching for uh, the word chill and the word instrumental more than ever. Uh, this is a few things. I mean, people are looking to relax. They're looking to be distracted. Instrumental is also kind of work music. People are looking for music that they can listen to to drown out the other people that they're stuck with in their houses, whether it's their kids or spouses or relatives, right? There's a lot of interesting at-home environments uh, and people are looking for opportunities to kind of you know, plug in or unplug from, from other situations. Um, so any content where you can offer distraction, entertainment, uh, education, um, humor uh, for some brands if it fits for you. Uh, this is from uh, Congaree National Park. Obviously, the, most of the national parks are still closed in the U.S. Uh, this is actually a video tour they did, a really slow, uh, relaxing tour that they did of their national park, one of their walking trails. It was really popular, it got shared a lot, very kind of meditative content. Uh, another example in that direction from a yoga app, 19 Minute Yoga. They did a series of IGTV videos that were just purely these really relaxing video scenes with a lot of great audio meditation over top of it. Um, and they did this for free on their Instagram app. Uh, in addition to these kind of meditative examples, there's a, there's a ton of uh, you know, music live right now online. There's a ton of entertainment, um, mixed media entertainment, all kinds of live shows going online. So thinking about how you can do that how you can invite people to those events that you wouldn't normally be able to invite because people are looking for ways to get involved in live events, in-home activities, and uh, distractions from kind of where we are in our daily lives. Uh, so that's it. Uh, we do have a conference where we're gonna dive into a lot of these, especially tone of voice. So if you wanna check that out, you can, socialpressx.com. We have about 50 free tickets left for that as of today, um, but I'll be available for questions as well. And thank you very much. Time. Thank you, Jason. Well done. We are on time exactly. I couldn't uh, get the chance. You were super uh, fast uh, to introduce yeah. you. That was our speaker, first speaker for tonight, uh, Jason Keith. Uh, Jason Keith, he is um, the CEO of Social Fresh. And uh, thank you very much, Jason. My pleasure. And thank you very much. And he talked about you know adapting your social media strategy to uh, uh, coronavirus trends um, and the uh, new user behaviors. Thank you, Jason. So we will go to our second speaker, uh, Tim Hoggs. He's the CEO and co-founder uh, of DLA Ignite. Uh, Tim, the mic is with you. Hey, Tim. Let's get Tim off mute. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Good, you can start, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the uh, the CEO of uh, DLA Ignite. Um, you can find us at dlaignite.com. Um, I'm also the author of the book Social Selling Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers, which is available worldwide on Amazon. Um, and um, today what we're going to talk about is selling through social media. So my background is mainly business to business, uh, though we do an element of uh, business to consumer, which I will be talking about. Um, but first of all, let's take a step back. Let's talk about the, the business case for, for social and, um, uh, and social selling. Um, so, for example, using a methodology and framework like ours, um, most salespeople would be able to get an additional uh, lead or meeting a week. Um, let's assume that from that one meeting, they can get a forecast opportunity per month and they can close an extra deal a quarter. That would mean that if your average deal size is 50 thousand dollars that would equate to an additional two hundred thousand uh dollars per salesperson in additional revenue per annum per person forever so that gives you some idea of the the, the prize that can actually be had out there on social so the world has changed and we know that the uh, the world has changed a lot through covid um we now know that the buyers are 57 percent of the way through the buying process and we will do anything to avoid actually talking to, to any salespeople. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether they're 57% of the way, 35% of the way through the buying process, or 75% of the buying through the way, way through the buying process. The fact of the matter is, is that people are now on social and they're actually, um, uh, they're making their choices. We all have a mobile phone. 
we all know how to use social networks and we're all making um, buying decisions based on that. The other issue that people have now in the buying process is that there are more and more people as part of the, the, um, the, the, the required to make that decision. So for example, 20 years ago, there was probably one person that was actually making the decision. And that would mean that you had an 81% likelihood that you would actually, um, that, that decision would be made. Now there's something like 10 decision makers per, uh, per opportunity. So how do you get around all those people and how do you get around all those people at scale? Because at the end of the day, what you need to do is be in a situation where people are gonna come to, come to a Zoom meeting and they're gonna say, right, we've got a couple of suppliers. How are you gonna make sure that they all put their hand up and vote for you? You do that by building um, relationships and in a world where you can't have face-to-face -face meetings, the only way that you can build relationships is through social. So what does a social landscape look like? Well, there's about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, 5.16 billion of those people have mobile phones, and there is 59%, so nearly 60% penetration of, um, of the world's population through the internet. Um, there are 3.81 billion active users on social media, which is about half the world's population. 300 million people joined social media last year. So you may have heard one or two people leaving Facebook, but 300 million people joined social media. Your buyers, your customers, your, um, uh, your users are on social media. And what you need to do is fish where the fish are. So three things that you, can, uh, you need to do in terms of um, social selling. First of all, you need to build your shop window. So whether that's on, on whatever uh, social media platform you need or you use, uh, you, need to have, you need to build your profile. If we think of the days in the, in, in the past where we walked down um, uh, miles, you'd look in a window, if there was something there that was an interest to you, you'd stop and look, you'd be curious. And what you need to do is be in a situation where the, what you're doing is that you're providing people with a curiosity to stop and look at you rather than look at your competition. The power is in your network. Your ability to um, the ability to move your territory online is so important. You need to put online all of those business cards you've got, you need to put online your, um, your customers, your prospects, your, the people that influence those, those decisions. And you need to create content and you need to engage. And you do that because our buyers are looking for experts and they are looking for people that are gonna help them. And what you need to do is actually help them buy. And you need to be there where you're having conversations with them. So give you some idea, as an example, this is my LinkedIn profile. Um, it has a, my picture, it has a header, uh, and it has uh, my title here. Now, the reason why my title is, is thus is what you need to do is actually create curiosity. You want to have people coming to your profile and saying, that's interesting, I want to read more. The important point is that your, your profile is your why, not your what. Your what just looks like another salesperson. Uh, your why actually creates um, intrigue. My title, for example, helps me close business. I get people coming to me and I've actually closed business off the back of having that title. You need to have a summary. Again, this is not about your company or your products. This is about you, your belief systems and why somebody would want to talk to you. What you're trying to do here is pull people closer to you rather than pushing them away by trying to pitch to them. The third thing you need to do is, is update your uh, contact information. In the old days when we had business cards, we had an address, we had a telephone number. Um, what we want to do is make sure that there are different ways that you can access the people and, 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 and talk to them. Uh, this is a great example of, of content. Um, Duncan is a salesperson at uh, one of our, our clients. It took him 30 minutes to write this, um, uh, this blog. Um, and he's had 119 likes, 62 comments. The average person on LinkedIn has 500 connections. So he's actually put his content, his beliefs, his, his, um, uh, his why in front of 59,500 people. That doesn't include the fact that there's your network's network as well. Steve Rafferty, he's a sales leader at one of our clients. He wrote this article, 71 likes. Um, 71 times average number of people Five of 500, that's 35,500. You'd, need need, need, you'd need to build an awful lot of emails to actually build up a list like that. So most organizations look like this. They use social tactically. 
we use social within digital, within marketing. Um, we use social probably within HR, and we may use social within sales. And the problem with this is it doesn't really get much results. Most people say we do social, but it doesn't really work for us. What you need to do is actually place social as a center of your business. You need to run your, so, run your business socially as a strategy. It's not just about sales, it's about HR, it's about customer service, it's about finance, it's about uh, uh, procurement, all the way through the business. And using social in the business, you will strip out cost and you will increase efficiency and increase sales. Another uh, example is by empowering your people to talk on social, 200 staff, 50% buy-in, one, uh, one um, uh, blog per month, you'll get uh, 1,200 keyword optimized pages on the internet every year. So what's in it for you? Well, first of all, you get personal credibility. You get people jumping to the conclusions that you want about you as an individual. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get inbound. So for example, one of our clients, BMW, in November, they got 28 pieces of inbound. They closed 14 of those. That's 14 sales, $50,000. It's about $700,000 for zero input of marketing. So increased sales, better prospects. And with better prospects, you get more choices of the clients that you actually want to talk to. By using social, you can have SEO dominance. You don't need to use paid media. Basically, what you do is you, you can reduce your costs of marketing, recruitment, and execution, and increase the output by just using social strategically. How do you make this happen? Well, you need a strategy. You need a plan for success. You need clear objectives. You need to understand what's going to uh, cause the barriers for you to be successful in terms of the people, the process, and maybe the tools that you need as well. You also need an implementation plan about what you're going to do and how you're going to uh, gain that and how you're going to make that pro uh, uh, possible. So quick whiz through 10 minutes talking about selling on, on social. If you want to have more information, um, please check out my book. Uh, I checked today, there's over 80 um, five-star reviews. It's a good place to start and a good place to, to, to just create a conversation. Please connect Thank with you. me on LinkedIn and on uh, Twitter. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Exciting. Thank you very much for joining us. And we will go to the third speaker, Mr. Neil Schaffer. He's the author of The Age of Influence. And also, um, he is the author of Maximize Your Social. We, uh, we met Neil two years back here, back in Bahrain. And now he is introducing his uh, latest uh, achievement, influencer marketing. Neil, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, greetings to everybody around the world. We're going to look at, and you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives from a lot of great uh, thought leaders today. Uh, I'm going to give you my own perspective on marketing in the age of COVID-19, some things that you need to change and some things that you need to consider that perhaps don't change. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, this is what I do. New book, The Age of Influence. If you're interested in what I'm talking about today, I highly recommend you pick up that book. It just came out two months ago. Um, but let's first look at marketing in the age of COVID-19. And then I want to give you my advice vis-a-vis -vis influencers and influencer marketing. First of all, I think that we need to remember a lot of businesses have really freaked out as they should as what has happened. Uh, I like to remind people, remind companies why they are in business. And this is a quote from actually someone at Walmart, believe it or not. Business exists to serve society. At the end of the day, your mission, your objective is to help people, or if you're a B2B business, help other businesses. And that should really be what defines you in how you respond today. Because I believe this is not a time for silence. And I know that there was a lot of external communication right after COVID-19 started that was just, you know, what do we say? Um, I believe that your community needs you, right? And in fact, they needed you before COVID-19. They always needed you and you always should have been serving them. Well, now you need to continue serving them and it's gonna be in a slightly different way, but the needs are even greater. So the number one thing, and I'm gonna be moving pretty fast. There's a lot of content to cover and I wanna stay within my 10 minutes. Uh, Jason Keith already from Social Fresh, the first uh, keynote had a really, really great uh, advice on, on pivoting your messaging and really do a sanity check, right? Maybe you scheduled your social media content or you scheduled new blog posts or, or events, uh, online events, 
So it really make sure that it is aligned with the here and now, with the experiences that your customers are going through because we are in unprecedented times. But there are many ways in which you can serve your community. This is a Japanese restaurant here locally in Southern California and they have takeout, but in addition to buying their bento box, you can get their home essentials box, which actually includes two rolls of toilet paper and two masks. A little thing that they are doing to help people. And a lot of their clientele are actually uh, Japanese uh, business people that are here by themselves away from home. This is something that can help them you know, basically survive, uh, especially when they may not have the time uh, or the resource to be lining up to buy masks or toilet paper. Uh, this is something that the alumni of the year that I graduated from college, there are only 400 of us, we have raised over $20,000 to make masks. One of our alumni has a clothing factory, so she's going to make masks to donate to uh, our alumni that are on the front lines that are fighting the coronavirus. This is something that any company can do. Any company can sponsor. If you're cutting down your budgets and you have $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, you can make an impact and really help people in your community. Uh, we've seen a lot of software companies. One of my favorites is Tailwind. Uh, they're uh, a leading app for Pinterest and Instagram. They have a small business relief program. They are giving away $1 million of free software, right? So your sales may not grow now, but it doesn't mean you can't grow your customer base. And when the time is over and we're done with this pandemic, guess how your sales are going to grow? It's going to grow from that new customer base because you did the right thing. Here's another one local gas station. I go to pump gas. I see a little note. What does the note say? As a thank you, we're actually lowering our prices by 50 cents. And I confirmed it wasn't 50 cents. It was more like 40 or 45 cents. But indeed, th their prices were just drastically lower than anyone else. And guess what gas station I'm going to go to? N not just now, but well into the future as well. Because at the end of the day, people remember. And I'll never forget when the Berlin Wall came down. This is a picture of Budapest, Hungary in 1956. When the Berlin Wall came down, People, you know, that older people said they, they never forgot the days, uh, you know, the, the, the pre-communism days of Eastern Europe. Uh, I was in Beijing, China during a lot of Tiananmen demonstrations. And when I meet people from Beijing, China that were there, they remember. People remember the good and the bad. If you help people out in their time of need, they will remember you and it will pay dividends. Also, and, and Jason talked about this as well, with the virtual cheese tastings, we need to meet people where they are. You, if you're used to doing physical events, you have to do virtual. My brother is a winemaker. He has a wine tasting room. He can no longer do that, but he can do Instagram live wine tastings. He can still ship products. And like the llama it, appearing in Zoom videos, he has found a new business model of executives wanting to do meetings, internal meetings, employee engagement meetings over Zoom but via wine tasting. And now he, he, this new sort of industry is blossoming. So, you know, there, there's crisis, but within the crisis, there just might be opportunity if you think out of the box as to how you can meet people where they are. So I believe your community needs you more than ever. I believe you need to serve your community. And there are many ways to do that, even if it does not directly involve your products and services. You can spend the time to improve your back end. Maybe you're gonna not do as much blatant advertising but there are things you can do, maybe rebranding of your website, these marketing uh, you go. I want to come plans that you've always wanted to do, but perhaps never had the time to do it. This is a great opportunity to do that. Obviously, you should be accelerating your digital. Uh, if, if you haven't been accelerating your digital marketing spend, this is obviously the best time to do that. And it's a time to also develop deeper relationships, deeper relationships, not just with your customers, with your community. And this is going to include influencers. So. This is why I think even in COVID-19, why influencer marketing still has relevance and importance. So when you look at the digital landscape today, a lot of companies focus on the SEO, the content marketing, the social media marketing, but with organic reach declining and with social media advertising costs go up, they forget about influence marketing. And my definition encompasses anyone who might have digital influence. This includes things like employee advocacy, includes things like brand advocacy, your customers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And the fact is that COVID-19 does not alter the long-term trends for influencer marketing, the things that I wrote about in my book. Because digital influence is everywhere and everybody is a publisher and is building some amount of influence online. And if you think about it, the original intent 
of social media marketing was inciting word of mouth, right? But it's, it's just very, very hard to do now organically compared to 10 years ago when a Facebook page got a lot of reach. This is where leveraging influencers has the value of inciting that word of mouth of people talking about your brand without you having to advertise your brand or without you even having to think of what to post on a daily basis in social media. We know the ROI for influencer marketing is long-term. When you have a traditional ad campaign or a social ad campaign, it goes on, it goes off, you're done. When you work with influencers, especially when you work with blog content or YouTube videos or even pins that go out in a search engine and they, they last for years, you can see how, because influencer content lives on, that ROI doubles over just uh, the course of a few months. We know Mark Zuckerberg announced back in 2018, we know that algorithms favor people will always favor people. Those of us that are marketers always knew this. Mark just made it public information for everybody to know. And the trust factor. We trust people like us more than anyone else. We, you know, we, we, more than a CEO, more than a PR person, more than an advertisement. So my recommendation now is to spend time as you develop relationships with people in your community, your customers, what have you, to also foster influencer relationships. Influencers are great at humanizing your brand, right? Of saying things that it may not be easy for your brand to say. Look for influencers in your community that you might be able to collaborate with virtually to do this. You can also obviously develop relationships for future collaborations. The lockdowns will end. We already see many US states already, uh, as well as in Europe. Uh, my friend in Finland said the kids are going back to school next week there. So prepare for future collaborations. You may not be able to activate them today. You'll be able to activate them tomorrow. Look for opportunities for content creation. Think of influencers as a focus group. They're very much tied into their community. Use that as a way to develop your relationships. See if you're missing out on a product or service or a way of serving your community. And most importantly, I want you to consider building an influencer army of brand ambassadors. Now, when I redefine influence, the traditional way of categorizing influencers is purely based on followers. And a lot of this comes from an Instagram-centric view of influence. But if influence is everywhere, it's not just Instagram. And if nano influencers only have a thousand followers, there's a lot of people out there that have some sort of influence, right? So I want you to think in terms of brand affinity. I want you to think in terms of employees, customers, partners, right? The people that already know, like, and trust your brand, who among them have some notion, some sort of digital influence? And then look at the followers of your accounts. Look at people who mention your accounts. They have some brand affinity. The problem a lot of brands do is they reach out to people that have low, zero brand affinity or may not even like you. So start with people that do like you. And if you're curious, this is just to finish off my presentation here, a case study of one such company, they are a watch brand called Rosefield. They developed this type of community. They recruited people looking at their database of customers, of followers, um, of, uh, of people in their email address book. They create or email marketing. They created three different tiers. Uh, they work with influencers in a variety of ways, and all they provided them were exclusive access to new products and points. And the results are pretty incredible. This is a program that I think every company should have, and it's a program that you can all be creating today. Thank you very much for your time. I wish you the best of luck. Ali, back to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Wonderful uh, and exciting uh, uh, presentation. And now we go to the fourth speaker. Uh, we will introduce, uh, I'd like to introduce my partner in success, Caroline Jones. She is our executive director at the Social Media Club, and she will talk more about Social Media Club. Please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, love our session so far, and thanks for bearing with us as we navigate this format. And um, if you can see my screen, I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, your support of Social Media Club enables us to be able to do more events like this and to be able to continue expanding our programming. Um, I'm jumping in for Laura Bedrossian, uh, who is one of our members in New York. She was having some Wi-Fi issues. I think we've all probably had those ourselves over the past few weeks and over quarantine. So. We'll give her some grace and if she can join us later, we, we will make that work. But wanted to let you all know that we are doing a quick little promotion today for membership. If you sign up to become a member on our website, you can use the code SMC Talk 
for a one-time 30% discount on all of our membership products. And we have um, a whole range of plans for individuals at the professional level, nonprofit, education. So if you're a student or if you're faculty and staff at a university, you can take advantage of our education pricing. We have small business, um, corporate memberships. We also have a blogger membership. And then we ha offer a wide range of pricing. So if you would like to pay monthly or quarterly, annually, so all types of payment plans, flexible to what we, um, we want to make that attainable and accessible for everybody. So that's a quick um, note on membership. And then wanted to briefly mention if, um, if you're joining us today as a guest, but um, would just like to help us out. We have been profoundly impacted by the coronavirus. As you know, we're, we're doing a lot more virtual events, which is wonderful. More people can participate, but we really do miss our in-person events. We, and we would like to make sure that when we are able to start hosting in-person events again, that we can build up a budget to make sure that it's really fun and meaningful and that we um, are able to buy all the food and drinks at our favorite local restaurants and just be together. And it would, we would really um, benefit from having your support. Um, we are um, just, just my, my simple request. If you have a, have room in your heart and your wallet for social media club, we would greatly appreciate your contribution and your support. And quickly, I wanted to let you all know about some of our upcoming events. Um, Adam Bell, who's joining us from LA, he's been active in the chat. He will be moderating our upcoming Social Media Club LA Foodie Frenzy event on May 19th. And um, he's got some exciting panelists lined up that work in the restaurant industry. And if you'd like to register, we've got a link directly on our homepage at socialmediaclub.org. You can click into that link as well. And we'll be, share, be sure to send the recording around to everyone afterwards. So we'll be able to catch up on this. And then on the 28th of May, our Atlanta chapter is uh, bringing back, they've been doing a social short format event where it's, it's if anybody's familiar with the Pachakacha format of events where everything slides and images in 20 seconds, it's really fun. So tune in. And if you'd like to join our Atlanta chapter on the 28th, that's another one. Um, LA is doing a virtual happy hour. I believe their next one will be on June 4th. And Des Moines, where I am from, we host the annual Hashi Awards. And um, our global team has been working to eventually keep bringing, expanding this program so that more chapters can participate. And we are looking forward to having more announcements to share on that end very soon. And that was really all I had, so. Excellent, Thank you very much. thanks Caroline for the updates from the Social Media Club, as she says. We have interesting events coming up. We have special offers on memberships and other events. So stay tuned and follow Social Media Club on Twitter to find out all these things. Thank you very much, Caroline. And our next speaker that also I met in Bahrain a few years back, uh, Scott McCain. He is the CEO of the Instinction Institute, and he will be talking about the five factors for iconic social media in the post-pandemic economy. Uh, Scott, the mic is with you. Hi, my friend. It's so great to see you again. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's it's a it's a privilege, and uh, I've learned so much from listening to, to to Neil and to all the other folks that were speaking today. So it's it's great to learn as as well as to share. Uh, let me talk for just a minute about uh, what 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 my role is today. My assignment uh, for today is to talk about. Uh, the five factors that, that we found through our research that are critical and important uh, in social media for success for the future. This is based on the book Iconic. We were really, really fortunate that uh, Forbes named it one of the 10 best business books of the year last year. American Express just sent out a, a flyer to uh, all the holders of their platinum business cards saying there were six books that would help businesses innovate uh, through the COVID-19 uh, challenge and, and very, very fortunate that this book was one of them. 
what we tried to do was to study what is happening in social media and in organizations that help them stand out from the clutter, take them so that they became a great example. And one of the first things that we found is it was critical for iconic organizations uh, to play offense. Here's what I mean by that. Typically, and particularly during times of stress and challenge, what we tend to do is to look at what our competitor is doing. And that stops us from innovation. When, when we're focusing on our competitor and not our customer, we tend to be reactionary. It, it, one of the silly things that we did to, to try to, to learn from this and that I, I discovered was in, in sports, there's the old line that defense wins championships. Yet if you look at the data, it's not true. For example, in American football, more Super Bowls have been won by the better offensive team than the better defensive team. So defense doesn't win championships in sports or in business. The data shows it's offense. It's, it's creating your own course and your own path. And really, that's what today is about. What can we do to create our own offense, our own plan of how we will be unique in terms of delivering uh, to our clients and our customers the best that we can in terms of, of, of social media and, and using that as the way that we can, can market more effectively. Uh, the second one was kind of surprising. It stopped selling. In social media, we found, and in business, we found that those organizations that focused less on hawking their products and services, less on pressure tactics to close sales, and more on creating experiences became the organizations that stood out in a hyper-competitive marketplace. So in other words, what we have to do is to build relationships. One of the ongoing research programs we've got now is that the organizations and the individuals that are reaching out to their customers on social media, not to sell something, but just to check in. How are you doing? How can we serve? How can we be of help? Are getting greater traction, greater response, and greater engagement than those that are using social media to, to try to sell something. I understand that we have to conclude transactions to stay in business, but we're doing that more and more through relationships and less and less through discounts and special offers and the typical kind of thing that has been associated with, with typical selling. Here's the third and maybe the most important, that is that customers evaluate us on just two factors, the promise that we make and the performance that we deliver. And when promise and performance aren't congruent, that's when customers get dissatisfied and that's when they uh, turn away from what you're doing on social media. One of the challenges is that most of our businesses are constructed vertically. You have a social media team or you have a marketing team. You've got a sales force. You've got a finance team. You've got a service team. And so we've, or, we, we've structured our organizations vertically, but our customers have the experience horizontally. So in other words, the fact that one group is doing social media, another group might be making the individual sales promise, but then another group is responsible for the performance it's where much of the dissatisfaction that we're getting from our customers is coming from. But they'll always blame the people who make the promise more than the people who deliver the performance. And so if we're not congruent in terms of what the promises are that we're making in social media and the performance that's being delivered, we're always going to have that challenge in terms of how we communicate and how we deal with our customers. So promise and performance must be congruent. What we found is that more than anything else, Customers want us to do what we said we would do when we said we would do it. There is little benefit to under-promise, over-deliver. The real benefit is that what we promise on social media is what we deliver through all of the channels that we have as touch points with our customers. The fourth is surprising as well, go negative. By that I mean we pursue information on the negative and fix the process, solve the problem, and retrain the personnel. So social media can be a great spot for us to go negative. I, I don't mean that we become negative people. I don't mean that we have a negative attitude. But so many times what we've done on social media in terms of our customer outreach is to make sure that individual customer is placated, but we don't solve the problem that created it in the first place. We've got to use social media as a tool to help us fix our processes as well as solve individual customer problems. Because when the process is out of line, you know, the, the chances are pretty good that it's going to stay out of line and we're going to create more dissatisfied customers. That's, that's a, a, a different one, a kind of a challenging one, but a critical one for, for us to, uh, to, to understand and to evaluate. And then the, the fifth and final one is what I call reciprocal respect. 
we see a lot of disrespect, unfortunately, on social media. We see a lot of disrespect for products, for people, for services, for customers. And what we have to do is to be above the fray in everything that we do in social media. We've got to be above that. We can't continue to feed the trolls. What we have to do is, and I see it here in the, in, in the comments, yes, we, we have to genuinely care. And the other thing is we have to go first. I, I, I've worked with so many organizations and people have said to me, frontline people have said to me, well, you know, if, if management treated me with respect, I'd treat frontline, you know, I'd treat our customers with respect. I've heard people say, well, if customers were nicer to me, I'd be nicer to them. If people were nicer to me on social media, I'd be nicer to them. We have to go first. We have to take responsibility for that. And, and whether we get respect in return or not, we have to exemplify that in everything that we do. We have to show that we genuinely care. And social media is one of the, the, the foremost ways that we can do that. So those are the five factors of iconic social media and iconic performance that we play offense. We know our competition, but we don't focus on them. We innovate to make them irrelevant. Second is we stop selling. Yes, we have to close deals, but what we have to do more is to create experiences that enhance the lifetime value of our customers. And the way that we connect with those customers is via social media. We've got to make sure that the promise we make on social media is equivalent to the performance that we want to deliver we fix the process by going negative and we display reciprocal respect. Those are the five factors of iconic social media performance. Ali, thanks again for the privilege of being with you today. Oh, that's all good, great. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, th thanks McCain for the nice presentation. Um, uh, dear attendees, please type your questions in the Q and A uh, section. We already have six questions and are answered by our lovely uh, and exciting speakers. So if you have more uh, questions, please go to question and answer section, type in your question and it will be answered by, the, uh, by our exciting uh, speakers. And now we go for our next presentation by Ariel Robin. He is the director of communication at Come and Go. And he will be talking about how to create a 21st century brand online. Errol, please, the mic is with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And, oh, great. Uh, pull this up so everyone can see. All right. And let me play. There we go. Hi, thank you guys all so much for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to speak about how I think we can run a 21st century brand on and really leveraging social and how we do that. Um, I'll start, I realize this GIF is a bit distracting, so maybe I'll go to the next slide because it's a lot. Sorry, <laughs> but I like it. It's a good um, one. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, so I'll start by talking a bit about myself. My, my name is Ariel. I'm the communications director for a convenience store chain called Come and Go. A lot of you probably haven't heard of it, but uh, if you haven't, I, or I suggest you follow us on, on social media, on Instagram or Twitter. At, K-U-M-A-N-D-G-O. It's a bit of a funny name, uh, and we try to work with that funny name, and, and Caroline has helped me work with that, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, my background, just to be brief, so I haven't always worked in a convenience store chain in Iowa. I actually spent about eight years working in international nonprofits. I was in the United Nations for five years working in communications. Um, I worked in Sudan, I worked in Turkey, traveled the world there, and then I worked in Geneva, Switzerland, for three years, the International Committee of the Red Cross. And my job there really was, how do we tell the story of an NGO that really wants to tell the story like a brand? I've seen a lot of nonprofits that were trying to tell their story like for-profits. And the funny thing is that I ended up joining a for-profit company that in a lot of ways is trying to tell its nonprofit story. It's trying to tell how it's making the world a better place. Because what I think we all know is that a lot of companies now need to lead with their values. They need to show what they care about and how they care and how they show up for their people and that's never been more important than with coronavirus, right? So I have the same, uh, someone else put up a similar stat earlier. Um, I mean, the point of this slide is simply to say that uh, why to get, why, why be on social? I don't think I need to really tell everyone here because you all know everyone's there, right? You need to be where everyone is and you need to talk to them. And I love the last slide, the last speaker who said, you know, we got to stop selling to people because what I think happened when I came to come and go, and I'll speak about my personal experience here was that we did a really good job at selling people things, but we hadn't done a great job at telling people our story. And we can't expect people to care about us if they don't know who we are, right? Every convenience store 
wherever you are across the world can sell you a Red Bull, right? Every convenience store can sell you a slice of pizza or a hot dog. That's not unique. What's unique about a story or a brand is who they are and what they believe in. That's what matters. Again, this is all pre-COVID and it's never been more important than today. So when I left the International Red Cross, I left because I thought, okay, I'm done talking about and communicating about, you know, really difficult humanitarian crises. And I had been working on the Ebola crisis and I thought I'm done. And I ended up coming here and now I'm working on coronavirus. So uh, in a lot of ways, um, this story is, is, a, is a universal one and one that, you know, I, I want to say, I didn't think I'd be there again, but here we are. And I think there's a lot of lessons you can learn from the international sector and the nonprofit sector that you can apply to your brand and your business and your social presence. So I'll talk about what we did here over the last year. And hopefully there's some applicable lessons. And again, feel free to ask questions or, or, or send me DMs on Twitter. My DMs are open. For me, the first thing that was really important was finding the right people for the right platform. I think a lot of times I've seen a lot of brands will take a piece of content and they'll say, okay, cool. This is good for Facebook. Let's put it on Instagram. This worked on Instagram. Let's put it on uh, TikTok. You know, there's just a sense that everything is sort of universally um, applicable. But the truth is that's not, that's not the right case. And the first thing I think that matters, and I don't know if a lot of companies do this properly, is really find the right person who understands the right platform. So I'm 35 years old, not to date myself here, but I know that I don't know anything about TikTok. That's my first key of metric of my own personal success is that I'm too old for this platform. I'm not the target demographic. I don't really get it. I'm not good at it. So what I wanted to do was make sure that when we piloted TikTok, that we had someone who was a subject matter expert of TikTok. So fortunately, I work for a company that has um, kind of given me a bit of faith to, to find the right people and really let them speak. Because what we all know is that you can't really fake it. If, if you're being fake on TikTok or being fake on Instagram, people will sense it, right? Audiences are savvy and they can smell BS. So we really wanted to make sure we found the right person. So I came to Iowa and I spoke to some people in the community. I said, in Des Moines. Uh, and I said, who really work? Who's amazing on TikTok? And they're like, oh, you've got to meet this young person. Their name is Evelyn. They have 180,000 followers and they're totally out there. They're 19 years old. So I called Evelyn and I said, Evelyn, do you want to come work for Come and Go and be our first ever TikTok uh, intern, apprentice? And they were like, I love it. And I brought Evelyn on and we started this 10 weeks ago. And we're at 10 weeks later, we've got 12,000 followers. Organic, right? Completely organic. And that's all because Evelyn's a brilliant genius and understands TikTok implicitly. And I have no idea what it is, but I let Evelyn be Evelyn. Similar for Instagram. Instagram originally, a year ago before I was here, we would just post pictures of Red Bull, right? Everyone can post Red Bull. But what we wanted to do was tell your best story of your life, right? What you follow on Instagram probably is really great stuff, right? Instagram is really a platform for that best life. So what I wanted to do on Instagram was make sure I had someone who understood Instagram. Again, I'm a bit too old for Instagram. So I found a young woman named Nadia, who's 23 years old, who has 12,000 followers of, of her own. And I said, Nadia, can you, you can make Mexico and, and, and uh, um, bathing suits look really awesome. Can you do the same thing for a convenience store in Iowa? And Evelyn took on the challenge and has done a really fabulous, fabulous job. Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit of an egoist, I kept Twitter because I love Twitter and I, I'm really, I'm passionate for it. And that's sort of my medium. So I think the port, my, my thing here is find the right person for the right platform. Now, the second part, though, and this is what's important, is you have to actually trust them, right? You can get the best person in the world to run your social, but if you don't trust them to use their voice, you're ultimately going to, I think, end up with subpar content. You can't fool people or trick them into following you. You can't fool, fool, fool people into engaging with you. You've got to really be there. You've got to really engage them. So uh, I have an example with Caroline uh, on your left. That you can, hopefully you can see, but this is like, Probably my biggest, our biggest social media win we've had on, on, on Twitter. And again, I have to thank Caroline, totally unprompted for doing it. But Netflix, um, you know, because again, you also have to be very reactive, right? So Netflix posted this. What's something you can say during sex, but also when you manage a brand Twitter account, every brand jumped in, everyone. I mean, all the big ones. And I sat there thinking, what am I going to do? You know, we have this silly name. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? I have to do something. And I really was debating it. I was agonizing. And then Caroline throws in the, I feel like you can win this one. And I say, not touching it. And that got 43,000 likes within Buzzfeed, et cetera, et cetera. And really kind of lifted us off in terms of our lives. So thank you, Caroline. Um, similarly, we've seen videos here on TikTok with Evelyn totally being ridiculous, garnering hundreds of thousands of views and comments and reactions. Uh, again, same, you see a completely different look on our Instagram as well. So again, different looks, different vibes, but the whole point is that it's authentic. Um, and I'm really fortunate to work for a leader that really trusts the people to run the platform according to the voice they think matters for it. Um, we did keep it clean. So 
I come back to this idea, and this is just what's worked for us, finding that right voice. You know, each, I don't put a piece of content across each platform. We really try to design and, 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 and focus that content per platform. Facebook, we still find the great value out of, right? But it's our audience is older. Um, it's family oriented. It's more earnest. It's more honest. It's more sweet. Uh, we find that stuff really performs. TikTok is our fun, weird, out there, authentic voice. Instagram is your best life. And Twitter is self-effacing and funny and, and super on trend. Again, we try to engage with trends and, and find ways to direct them back to our company as soon as possible. And we've seen ROI on this repeatedly. It's, I'm not just doing this to do it. We do it because it aligns people and gives them a reason to love us. And that's ultimately what it's about, right? And fundamentally what it comes down to, again, is that point at the bottom, all four are authentic both to the brand, the platform, and the brand, the platform, and the person producing the content. And I just have one last slide, which ties it back to COVID. Um, you know, people will say, uh, I've heard people say, I'm like, what? well, okay, what's the point? Like, you have all these things. But the point of it also is that when there is a dynamic changing situation, a stressful situation, something where we really need to get the communications up, if we don't have the audience built in from, the, from before, then we're unable to tell that story now. So we were fortunate that we've been cultivating this audience for the last year, that when COVID hit, we were able to put our content out Twitter first and Instagram first and really get people to engage. So you can see just four examples I put up here of ways that we tried to work our tone, but also get our message out there. Come and then go right back home, right when we were telling people to stay home, it was one of our most popular tweets. Um, talking about our stores were, you know, that our stores, our, our store workers were heroes, our essential workers were heroes, super popular tweet. But an interesting point about that I'll add is that because people can smell BS, that you have to make sure if you're a brand who's gonna call your person a hero, you're backing it up with, with policy that actually supports them because otherwise your respondents on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook will say, that's nice that you're calling them a hero, but are you paying them extra? Are you providing them with PPE? Are you helping them through this time? So we wanted to make sure that we were there. Luckily, again, we work for a company that does that. So that was super important. Uh, we were able, you can see the bottom right, to show that our associates are heroes and here's how we're showing how thankful we are. We're offering them bonuses and so on. All of that I think is holistically part of this. And then on the bottom left, Casey's and Quick Trip are two other convenience store chains in the, in the area. So it's kind of this moment to be sweet and say, hey guys, we miss you. Um, so again, you know, we would have, I would have been able to put this content out anyway, but the point is that we wanted to make sure we had the audience to receive it. And that's what we're doing with all the fun stuff we do in the other slides. It's about cultivating an audience so that they're actually there that once you click publish on your content, you have someone to engage with. Um, I spoke extremely fast. I always do it. So I apologize if I was too fast. Um, I'm basically at the end of my presentation, but I'm also happy to answer questions or move on, or you can DM me. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone, Ali, Caroline, everyone for having me and all the other speakers who were fabulous. Uh, it's a real pleasure to listen to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Zareen. Well done. You are exactly on the, um, uh, on, the, on the time. So we have a poll for everyone, for all our attendees and speakers as well. We have a question. This is our first poll for the, for the forum. Can you please go to the polls and answer uh, the question, has your brand experienced more or less engagement on social media changed since COVID-19? Is it more engagement, about the same? Is it less engagement? Can we see some results, please? Sorry about my typo. Has your brand experienced more or less engagement since COVID-19? Thoughts oh, are still coming. What, where, where's the poll? Okay, it's with you. Yeah, so okay. so far is only 87 people. Please, all attendees, please answer the poll. Everyone okay. answer? Now, uh, we will close in five seconds. Okay, good. Four, three, two, one. Let's see the results. Share the results. More engagement. Okay. So maybe one of the speakers will talk about this later on. Uh, the attendee says that they got more engagement on social media when the COVID-19 started. Thank you very much. Let's take a screenshot, guys, from the poll so we can talk about it later. Oh, it's like ready to smile. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, so our next speaker for, the, for tonight is Vladimir. Um, he's, uh, he's from UAE, actually. He's in UAE. He's an entrepreneur, influencer, Fortune 500, consultant, and keynote speaker. And he will be talking about how to become a real marketing practitioner and build your personal, um, 
per brand. Uh, Vladimir, please Hello. go ahead. The mic is you. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Ali. Thank you for inviting to your talk. And uh, I'm very happy to share my expertise with you all. And thanks to everyone for great insights. And um, I have always been inspired by the majority of uh, marketers we have today in this talk. And uh, uh, well, you know, I would love to talk about today about practicality and uh, building a personal brand. Uh, uh, my name is Vladimir Boswadze. I come from Georgia, actually, from Eastern Europe, uh, but I live in the UAE. Uh, I have always been a global citizen and I have managed to live worked and studied in the United States, uh, in Virginia, Maryland, Washington DC, New York, also lived in London and uh, Dubai. And I also travel uh, all over the world for my work. And uh, uh, social media has impacted my work dramatically and tremendously. And I'm very thankful to social media because where I stand in 2020, uh, there, is, uh, there is a very popular uh, business quote that if you, uh, if you uh, don't build your dream, someone will hire you to build there. So I have always been inspired by this quote. And in 2014, I have decided to build my brand. Uh, and, uh, you know, building a personal brand requires so much commitment and ded dedication. And uh, uh, if you do a nine to five job and simultaneously, it, 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 it is impossible to build a personal brand because building Twitter, building LinkedIn and other channels, requires so much energy and efforts, you know? So uh, in 2014, I isolated myself, uh, locked the door, put in the work, downloaded all apps, and uh, I have built my presence across maybe 30 social media channels, you know? So uh, it cost me zero dollar to build a million dollar business in, uh, in the recent years. And um, uh, well, everyone knows that, you know, everyone sells on social media, everyone sells on Twitter, everyone sells on LinkedIn. And uh, we, uh, these networks lack marketers and brand builders, you know. I, uh, the, uh, these networks uh, lack uh, professionals who provide uh, useful and uh, informative content. So uh, what is the secret of my growth across all my social media channels, right? Uh, I always provide uh, content uh, uh, I put out content that is in my followers' best interest. Not, uh, I never sell on social media. I never provide any content that is in my best interest, you know? So uh, I have managed to build uh, a great audience with my, uh, with my tribe across all social media channels, 125,000 followers, active, engaged, real followers across all social media channels, you know? And uh, I'm proud of uh, what I have built so far. And uh, uh, I, I have opened so many doors through, uh, through social media, you know, because you know, as everyone knows, it used to cost a fortune to distribute content uh, across uh, traditional media set years ago. And if we realize and acknowledge how lucky we are to have these networks that are free and available at our fingertips, then we hit the jackpot, you know, and we are so lucky. So I have always been fortunate to have all these networks available uh, at my fingertips. And uh, um, it has never been a better time for self-motivated people. Curiosity, ca courage, persistence, uh, and uh, patience uh, are the new gatekeepers, you know. Uh, uh, so I isolated myself for six years and uh, uh, I built uh, my Twitter, which has uh, 56,000 followers, and uh, it is uh, very hard for a a anyone to build uh, uh, Twitter to such extent, and I have built because of practicality. I, 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 uh, I believe that uh, global education is outdated, and uh, whatever they teach at business schools, uh, they teach uh, strategies and pra marketing practices that existed 30 and 40 years ago. And I know that uh, I know the majority of professors who follow me on Twitter and uh, also other networks and uh, they, they rarely teach anything about personal brand building, you know, and I rarely see any students who are inspired even to put out content across all other channels and to build um, their personal brands, you know, and um, uh, there is a great example of uh, Uber that uh, uh, founder of Uber, Travis Kalanick, hired uh, Ryan Graves through Twitter, and this this person is a billionaire now nowadays. Ryan Ryan replied 
replied uh, Travis and he became billionaire, you know? So I think that a single tweet can uh, make someone a billionaire if they are curious, if they are, if they are persistent and if they are, um, uh, if they are a, a true brand builder, you know? And so Ryan proved that he's a great marketer. He's a brand product manager. That's why he, uh, no, go, go, gain ground and go places. So, uh, so, uh, so I I'm very proud of my achievements in 2020, and I have joined so many trade associations, uh, conferences, marketing firms, startup advisors, and now I'm ranked uh, among uh, 500 uh, professionals by Crunchbase. You know, because of my social media presence, and I uh, receive like uh, advisory roles and so many uh, opportunities and roles uh, from all over the world world to uh, join forces with startups to uh, uh, mentor top executives uh, for to 500 brands and uh, uh, also deliver lectures uh, at uh, top business schools and uh, it is incredible how much I have uh, achieved and uh, accomplished through social media and I think that uh, we need to uh, we need to see more practitioners in the world in marketing because uh, we have too many headline readers and people just read uh, just a few articles on, on popular business publications and uh, then they don't put in the work, they continue watching Netflix, they go continue gossiping uh, about others and uh, they don't uh, build anything worthwhile instead of putting in the work, instead of putting out more content. And I believe that putting out uh, 100 pieces of content at, at scale across eight, 10 social networks is a key to success and key to, uh, is, is a key to personal brand building. And uh, uh, I, I, I spent zero dollar on my personal brand building. I, sp I, pay zero, I paid zero dollar to Twitter, to LinkedIn, Facebook, you know? And uh, I, I, my, my example show that uh, it is possible to build a million dollar business with your, through your efforts, through your dedications, through your commitment and uh, through um, uh, teamwork and collaboration because you know uh, if, if, if anyone googles me they will see my interviews my uh, me memberships my speaking engagements my everything you know so i believe that google google is our cv in 2020 and the traditional cv is dead unfortunately you know so met, uh, but not many people realize that and that's why uh, they my majority of people uh, use social media for entertainment you know and uh, i feel that because so many people follow me and they rarely um, uh, put out content that is informative that is enlightening and uh, uh, for example my content uh, galvanizes people uh, to become more to dream more uh, to build their businesses and uh, so many of my followers built million dollar businesses through practical tips that i provide across eight ten social networks and now i manage i track my progress from week to week from month to month uh, uh, my engagement uh, and uh, well, uh, I, I, I achieved, of course, I, I'm proud of everything I have achieved, you know, because I achieved a cloud score 18 a few years ago. I achieved a credit scores uh, 969 for influence and uh, it is, uh, we can achieve so much through practicality, you know, and I open so many doors because of social media, because of how much I inspired by top influencers and, uh, uh, and putting out 100 pieces of content is a key to success and uh, everyone should be more willing and more determined to build their businesses because uh, we pay nothing. Uh, to Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and all other channels, and we can uh, create blog posts on Medium, Thrive Global, and all other channels, and we can, uh, I mean, impact the world uh, uh, positively, you know? So uh, I'm, very, uh, I'm very happy that my expertise uh, helps uh, Fortune 500 brands to prepare to gain a competitive advantage and uh, prepare for the future, and a lot is possible when we work together. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I, 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 uh, Online, offline, teamwork drives amazing successes, amazing results. You know, uh, there is a, there is only we in business, never me. You know, so uh, I'm very excited about the future. And even uh, during this pandemic period, uh, everyone should be optimistic. Everyone should be um, uh, uh, like more uh, driven, more determined to put out more content uh, on you uh, to YouTube. Uh, uh, to document their journeys, 
uh, and uh, to become a real practitioners, real practitioners. And uh, I am sure that uh, I started my whole journey from the single tweet in 2040 because I had zero follower. And uh, when I see all these results, like memberships, speaking engagements, uh, like uh, uh, how much I achieve, uh, and it is sometimes it's incredible that I open so many doors and I gain ground. Go, I have gone places. I have moved up in moved up in the world because of social media, because of Twitter. Uh, and uh, when I was in uh, 2006 in New York City, nobody knew my name in New York City, and I was lost in uh, in such a big uh, uh, city, you know. And uh, now everyone knows my name in marketing, in business, and I work. Uh, with the whole world, you know, uh, you, in, in, and I'm so happy and uh, I'm very grateful and, and I always believe in giving back and uh, also uh, many people are inspired by my expertise, my by presence across all other social media channels and we can, uh, uh, we can uh, impossible is nothing, impossible is nothing and practicality is what we need to push more, you know, uh, even TikTok, we need to put out more content, like five, 10 pieces of content. Uh, like we need to provide more useful, uh, uh, educational and uh, in uh, informative content uh, to our audience. And I am sure that uh, we will achieve all our business obje objectives. Thank you very much. It was exciting to understand how you can build your brand with zero dollars, but only through, you know, using your your, uh, your content, your uh, personal branding, and etc. Thank you very much. And we will go for our next uh, speaker, which is Nick Sargent. Hi, Nick. Are you ready? Good. So Nick is our Vice President of a Standing Partnership, and he will be talking about making it easy for your customers, CX, in the COVID-19 era. Uh, be interesting presentation. Nick, the mic is with you. Nick, go ahead. Sorry, rookie, rookie mistake. I uh, just wanted to say thank you again for the invite and to, for the uh, opportunity to participate today. It's been a, a great session so far. A lot of what we've heard from folks like Neil and Scott and Tim is about the importance of getting closer to your customer, to be really empathetic, uh, to really be there for them. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about quickly today is some of those ways that you can do that, gather that information and be doing that from, from a safe distance, using some of the tools that like we're using today uh, in using this time as, as Neil mentioned, to start to build out that backend, to build out your insights. And it's particularly important right now. Uh, obviously one of the most important reasons is everything's changed. Uh, and with everything changing, it still is so critical for businesses to, uh, make sure that they are retaining their existing customers. Acquiring a new customer, many of you have seen this sort of statistic before, is much more expensive. And when you're talking about customer experience, it's a really great strategy to focus in on how can you retain the folks that you, that you already have, and how can you do that in an efficient and cost-effective way. Uh, and one of the reasons that's so important right now is the way that customers, even before the COVID-19 uh, 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 outbreak happened, is that they have changed their expectations. It's no longer enough just to have a solution. You really need to have an experience. It has to be something that somebody truly, truly enjoys, even if you're talking about a product that you're buying, that the service is so great that it's a great experience that they want to share, that it's fast, and that it feels personalized to their needs. When it comes to what's happening now, that experience needs to be, uh, is changing for a lot of people. Uh, it has profoundly impacted the way that we're all doing business. It's profoundly impacted the way that we're communicating with each other. And this is an opportunity for us to use that as a way to understand how can we get closer to them and how can we meet these needs that they have, particularly in a, pro, uh, a post-crisis uh, activity. So what I wanna share with you today is just three quick customer experience activities that you can be doing with your customers online today using social media to, to, to gather them, to engage them, and then to, to participate in some of these uh, activities. And, and some ways that you can get those insights is if you can work directly with your customers, right? If not, you can also use these activities with folks like salespeople, customer service, 
to get those insights and get a better understanding of what your customers need and what they're expecting from you now. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about is getting that, uh, that color around your customer's experience. What you see here, this is sort of the customer survey, uh, particularly those big voice of the customer surveys that you might do. They can be very intricate. They can tell you a lot of details. There's a lot of guidance that you're giving them. There's not much story here. You can get some information about what they might prefer, the way that they might be reacting to things, and how they might go about it. But it's really when you ask somebody to draw a picture for you, when you get them to start to tell the story for you, that you get the true insight to understand what that pain really is, what that uh, experience is like for them, and what they need from you to help fulfill that experience. So the first thing that we get into is talking about having them to draw out that buying experience. And you can ask them to do this in a variety of ways. Just like that little girl who, who held up the picture, you can have them just draw it out. Uh, if you're on a Zoom, uh, you can give them a storyboard in advance and have them sort of fill out a couple uh, bubbles and start to walk you through that process. You can have them take the whole buying journey if it's something that's relatively simple, or if you wanna get really specific, maybe you know that uh, the onboarding process is a place that you really wanna get better at, or the uh, raising awareness with your customers, educating them about your space is a place that you really need to, to get better at. This is an opportunity for you to, to dive deeper into that. Uh, as an example, this is something that we did with a client of ours uh, where we were going out and trying to understand how can we deliver a better experience for the customers of this particular organization that uh, sold retirement products to church workers. Uh, those church workers, uh, they don't have a lot of money. Typically, they're usually going to work uh, someplace where they're doing it for the mission and the value, but providing a retirement, planning for retirement is really important. So what we went out and said, what is it that's going to help you? What's gonna bring the most value uh, uh, to you as part of the exercise that we did with them? And what they started to bring back is, here's what it looks like to me. Here's what it is. And you can say, oh, I'd like to have face-to-face -face meetings, but these, these pictures start to give you some story around, oh, I wanna I want have a really intimate conversation with you that's not in my workplace. I wanna go out and really get to know you and have a discussion about how I need to, to, to plan for my retirement. It's not just that you offer me so many different plans that I could put my money into, it's that I need the guidance and the suggestions from you uh, of how to do it. This can be really helpful in help, uh, under, helping you understand what are those real pain points that, that, that somebody has, what are those details, or what are those things that they really need from your organization, and that can fill, help you fill out not just content, but also how you deliver the products. So another place that you can do this is to have them uh, go through a process where they're defining their moments of truth. What are those key interaction points that, uh, that they're going through as they're uh, making decisions, as they're buying your products, as they're using your services that really make a difference? And again, you can have them, if you have a chance to, to, to talk with somebody for hours, you can have them build this out across a very long journey. If you have an intimate conversation with somebody, you can just say, what's the most important moment in making a decision about buying our product and making a decision about what you are going to do about this service. And let's start to talk through this. You can do this in a, in a prompted way, you can do this in a small group, or you can do this one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so it, basically you wanna to get to a point where you're building out a profile, understanding who that buyer is, at what stage they're in, what they're doing, are they taking action? And then, and then ask them, is a potential action here of doing nothing at all? of just sort of stalling out to understand where people might be falling out of this process. Uh, you wanna ask them what, what they're thinking at that particular point, what's on their mind. That helps you get a real uh, a sense uh, as well as what they're feeling of how you need to show up at each of those stages and the sorts of content that you need to be providing them. It really starts to help you connect with them emotionally of uh, if this is something where I'm really scared, it's gonna change your positioning and it's gonna change the way that you go to market. It's gonna change what you put on social media if, uh, if you originally thought that maybe they were happy at a particular stage. So this is uh, something that we've been doing online with some of our customers and some of our clients' customers. And uh, a tool that we've been using is uh, Mural. Uh, you can find it at mural.co. I believe they're still uh, having people uh, or giving out pe uh, uh, free trials of the software. 
And it's a great opportunity. You can use this in a Zoom setting like this and move things around. It's almost like having a big whiteboard on your screen with Post-its, or you can have people collaborate with you. So if you have a smaller team, if you have a sales team, if you have customers that are very uh, technically savvy, you can have them sort of guide through this themselves, or you can guide them through it uh, as you're doing the exercise. It's been really valuable to help us understand what are those things that, uh, that are really difficult or really important in making that decision. Uh, and, and here's an example of, of just some of the ways that you can do this and some of the information you might get. Now, one, two, it's just a little bit of an anecdote, but as you build that set, you start to see trends. You start to see where maybe there's these sort of commonalities or there are these pain points that you weren't expecting before. And this gives you some real insight into what you should be doing next, and maybe where you should be focusing on within the buyer journey uh, and what emotions uh, and uh, feelings, things that you can be solving as you're going through and building your marketing campaign. Uh, and then lastly, and something that I think a lot of us have done is you can use this time to start to build out that journey map. Maybe it's just a segment of the journey. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe it's the whole thing. Maybe you're using your sales team, as we mentioned before. Maybe you're building with a small segment of customers. This is an opportunity for you to drill down and say, what's most important to us? How might these things that if we've done the moments of truth, if we've had them draw out the, the painful parts of the experience, where are the places that we need to focus in on and how can we get a little bit more detail around it? Getting those key customer questions, what the customer goal is at each of those stages, uh, and what's that painful uh, barrier that you're taking uh, to, 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 uh, to take action or to have them answer the questions. Again, here's an example of what we've been doing with some of our customers and some of our clients uh, using Mural during this, this time. And that's to take those moment of truth cards and maybe plot them out uh, over a particular stage or a particular phase and say, all right, if this is a critical moment of truth, let's, let, let, let's dive into this a little bit more. What are those key questions that you're, fa you're, you're facing at each of those phases? What are those goals? What typical uh, actions or touch points are you having at this stage? And what's the most painful and what's the most friction? What you can then do is use a tool like this have them vote and find out, all right, what are the highest pain points? Where are those places that we need to, uh, to be really focused on? Uh, you can bring back in that draw the buying experience exercise and say, all right, we're gonna pick this particular pain point in the process. Now, now instead of drawing what your experience is like, draw, draw us what the experience should be like. And again, you get that insight and that empathy into exactly how and exactly what the expectation of your customer is in solving those challenges. Uh, I've ran through this pretty quickly. We, we all had short time today, but um, I, I wanna make sure that I also touch on that you can uh, find out more about CX and find out more about some of these exercises uh, at standingpartnership.com. We have a podcast that we've launched this year called Getting Closer to the Customer that you can find on the website. You can always get in touch with me on Twitter or via email. Thank you very uh, thank you much, again. Nick. Thank you very much. It was amazing uh, to see some exercises and I see in the chat that people love it. So thank you very much. And we'll go for our next presentation, a colleague and a partner in success, Vincent Orlek, a president of Social Media Club in Phoenix. And he will be talking about channel exclusivity. So uh, Vincent, the mic is with you. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, let me just set up my screen here. And get going. Okay. Um, hopefully, we'll turn up some of that. <laughs> great. Um, Great. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening, uh, depending where you're watching this. Um, my name is Vincent Rolly, president of Social Media Club Phoenix. Um, I don't know. I, I'm here working from home, uh, of course, in the work from home. I don't know how many of you are using the work from home mullet uh, with the dress clothes and pajamas and shorts on the bottom. Um, 
I definitely am. Uh, I'd like to thank the awesome team of Social Media Club Global uh, for putting this event together and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, you'll notice that the, the PHX there is capitalized because it, we don't represent just Phoenix, the city. We represent greater Phoenix uh, as a whole, and we're inclusive uh, in that way. Today, though, um, I do want to talk about uh, being exclusive, uh, and exclusive in a way that it's it's for good reason. Um, that is in the efforts to, to help brands and businesses stand out in, in a crowded online world and on social media in general. Um, it, it's funny because what a lot of what I'm going to talk about lies, uh, ties in with uh, what many of the other speakers have, have talked about, Neil and, and Ariel especially um, earlier. Um, so the, the goal of the Digital Talk Forum today is to discuss driving online traffic, planning and revisiting marketing strategies uh, in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, that last part about marketing strategies, specifically as it relates to social media, is where this high concept of channel exclusivity falls. I'll add this disclaimer. <laughs> um, in my experience over the last 18 months of talking about this and kind of presenting this idea, um, it's not one that everybody is open to um, or, or not even one that everybody can do, uh, especially at first, because it does fly in the face of 10 plus years of traditional social media marketing. Um, if, if there is such a thing in this young industry, I, I think there is, uh, for better or worse. And, and so if you find yourself kind of denying the plausibility, feel free to treat it even just as a simple thought experiment. Um, and, and plus, we've only got about eight more, more minutes to go, so you won't have to worry too much about, about it. Um, so first, I, I would challenge everybody to, to ask yourselves, as your business, as your brand, how are you different? Um, how is what you are dif doing different than what anyone else is doing? Now, some things will probably pop into your head as, oh, well, I do this or that. Um, is it truly different? You know, be, be honest when you're, when you're asking yourself, reevaluating your marketing strategies on social, are you being truly different? Um, it's difficult to be different. It's very difficult. Uh, you know, all the ideas have already been done, um, thought of and done, uh, is what most people think. But there's ways that you can be different. Um, are, but are you actually being different in your tactics, your strategies, um, the way you're using your social media channels and platforms? Are you more a contributor to, benefactor of, uh, or both when it comes to noise? Uh, the, the, the online world is, is full of noise, um, not just, you know, you're not just competing with, with other brands um, on social media, you're competing for attention with everyone, everything, as we all know. Your, your, your brand is competing with, competing with Netflix, um, especially during this time where people are home. Um, it's competing with family. It's competing with um, listening to podcasts, reading, um, going on various websites. Um, the noise, in this case, I would say it's, it's defined as, is, is the content that you're putting out there generally being passed over um, because it's more relevant to your goals rather than the needs, the needs of your audience. And that's, that's really what you want to consider is how are you addressing those needs? Um, we're, we're well over a decade right now into this whole social media marketing thing and we're still amazed by the brands that seemingly do it right um they're few and far between it seems because they get called out as oh look at how great a job this brand does for every good there there's an opposite and the reason why we're noticing the ones that that are out there that we're, we're calling out is because there's so many that are still just using the platforms as broadcasting, as one-way loudspeakers. And true social media usage, even by a brand, and especially by a brand, that's not where the benefit lies. Um, it doesn't lie in, in only going one way. So, so why should anyone care about what you're doing? That is the question. That is, that is the question that should guide any content that you're putting out there. Why is someone gonna care about this? There's all kinds of different reasons, but you have to answer that question in order to determine, is it worth it? 
And this, this question should be asked before you produce the content. You know, it's, it's part of the planning, part of the strategy um, that even as small businesses with limited resources, you still have the opportunity to evaluate and, and put out great content. You can do it. Um, this, this graph uh, came from Sprout Social recently within the last couple of weeks, uh, a, a report they did, a study that they did. Um, I think you can see the top five goals here. The top five goals here for marketers for social media. And then look at the sixth one, that one that's 30% connect with their audience. I see this as a problem. <laughs> I see this as a problem. If marketers, number six goal out of 10 is to connect with their audience because connecting with the audience is what's going to drive everything else. The, the other top five are seemingly governed more by numbers and analytics and, and reporting than it is by actual connection. Same report, why do consumers follow brands on social media? They asked consumers. Um, sorry, it's a little, uh, I had to blow it up. So it's a little bit, little bit pixelated. Um, the top five reasons why consumers follow brands on social media, learn about new products or services, stay up to date on company news, learn about promotions, to be entertained, to be educated. Those five things are, <laughs> they fall under connect with the brand. Those top five things fall under connect with the brand. So consumers do want to connect with your brand, but the brands seemingly don't want to connect with the consumers when they're asked that question. They're still too concerned about growing follower numbers, um, impressions, and, and di directly generating sales. Sales happen, um, as has been discussed before by some of the other speakers, sales will come. What happens when you focus on less content, but better content, higher quality content? There's this equation, this is part of it. Better content equals brand affinity. The full equation would be better content equals better messaging because you're putting more time into it, equals better, more valuable and more relevant engagement. That also equals better and deeper and more genuine relationships which then translates into affinity, which ultimately, ROI, sales, everything along those lines. Some of the key elements um, when it comes to content and channel exclusivity. Urgent, relevant, ephemeral. These are some things to keep in mind right now because of uh, being able to stand out in the noise is so hard. These are some things that can help stand out in the noise. However, too much content out there consists of creating fake urgency, containing info that your brand and you think may be relevant, but you haven't asked your customers. So you don't know if that content, if that, if what you're putting out there is actually relevant to them. If it's not relevant, they're not going to respond to it. Um, the ephemeral side, stuff just stays up forever. So there's no, it goes back to the urgency, right? There's no, there's no urgency for me as a, uh, a customer to pay attention to what you're doing in that moment because, oh, I can go see it later. So how can you be different? Focusing on, on great posts, videos, blog posts that have an actual urgency, actual relevancy, and making them ephemeral. Here's an example. Facebook Live on your Facebook channel. Whatever the content may be, whatever the video is, it's a piece of live video that you, pr you promote it ahead of time. You can even promote it on multiple channels, but the one place that it lives is on your Facebook Live. In addition to that, the one place that it, the one place that it lives on Facebook Live is in that moment. So every week, every two weeks, every month, you're setting that up where you have to be here to watch this. You're creating that urgency. You're creating that importance. And people, maybe not on the first one, but there's an element where if it's good enough, People are going to respond. Your audience is going to, is going to respond. Um, they're going to pay attention. We're already seeing examples of this. There's a couple different examples. Um, YouTube. YouTubers are putting their content on their YouTube channel. There, someone like uh, Shane Dawson, if you're familiar with him, does you know hour-long videos on YouTube. 
he's putting that on YouTube. He's not putting it in other places on his other channels. He may be talking about it and telling you to come over to YouTube, but the only place you're going to find it is on YouTube. You subscribe on YouTube, you get the notifications, but if you don't get the notifications, if you're a member of the audience and you're cons you really care about it, well, you know, okay, at this specific time, maybe he's been talking about it. I know it's coming. So it's, it's, it's top of mind. Um, some of the other more recent examples, Instagram live has been huge, huge lately. Um, you've seen DJs. There's a particular DJ, uh, D nice. He started this whole sort of, uh, move into DJs doing whole hour long, half hour long, whatever sets on Instagram live. You had to generally be there to watch that. Um, he might leave it up on his story for 24 hours. Um, maybe a little bit longer, but in general, on Instagram live, these producers, artists, government officials, celebrities, they're going on Instagram live. And if you miss it, you miss it. Um, that's, uh, in closing, <laughs> what I would say is, uh, what you can do to truly stand out is being there to answer your audience's questions and be helpful. Truly helpful is, is a big key. Um, whatever form you're choosing, don't just hop back on the same horse that you've been on for years. Uh, that's what too many, too many brands are, are about to do. It feels like, um, all of this is already happening. There are people already out there doing this, this individual channel exclusive content. You can't find it on their Twitter, but you can find it on their Facebook and vice versa. You have to give people a reason to follow you. If you have these multiple channels, um, could it work for your brand? Like everything else you need to come up with a plan a strategy, um, as well as some of your best content and then test it out and then measure it. It's important to measure those results. That's how we can do it expertly, accurately, and with meaning. Um, thanks again for having me and uh, I've been enjoying all the, all the speakers so far. Thank you very much, Vincent. That was an amazing uh, updates and uh, presentation uh, uh, to share with our uh, uh, attendees. I would just like to um, check out the attendees. Can you raise your hand? Yes. Okay, great, lovely. You know, sometimes after a few presentations, we need, you know, just to stretch up. So just can, can we stretch everyone? Yeah, good, excellent. Now you can, um, thank you very much for your stretching. And I'm just checking if our next speaker is there. Okay, I would like to, present to you Nicole Choman. Uh, Nicole is a reporter from PR News and she will be speaking about journalism during a pandemic, uh, covering COVID-19 now and in the future. Uh, Nicole, the mic is with you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm pretty excited to join you today. I have a long history with uh, Social Media Club. Um, so I'll do a quick, uh, just check about my background. Um, I used to work in social media for about 12 years and I used to live in Buffalo, New York. Um, for those of you from um, outside of the country that's near Niagara Falls, the big wonder of the world that you've seen probably on TV um, multiple times. Um, and uh, six years ago, I received a job offer to move to New York and decided that I wanted to expand my social media skills at some global companies. So I worked for AOL, which is now, I think, Oath or Verizon Media, one of those. Um, I worked at About.com, uh, Travel, and a few of the other sections, which is now Dot Dash and a whole other host of names. As you can see in the digital world, things change pretty quickly. Um, and in each of these things, even though I worked in social, um, my journalism background, and writing was always in my blood. So uh, recently, and it's been about over a year now, I've been at PR News and we focus on stories and articles about the industry, the communications industry. Um, I apologize for my email chime that just came in. Um, so we do that, uh, you know, focused on that industry. And right now it's been a really interesting time because communications really is at the forefront of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, a lot of people, there's a lot of miscommunication going on. There's a lot of people saying one thing and doing a completely other thing. Um, 
<clears throat> government, <coughs> cough, cough. Uh, you know, should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Um, what are employees supposed to expect if, when offices, if they do reopen? Um, communications plays a role in all of those sorts of aspects of this disease. Um, it's not just about healthcare anymore. Um, it's about economics. And so we try to provide practitioners in the PR and digital and communication spaces with um, not only the latest news about what's going on, but also great ideas um, and different things that brands are doing. So I'm um, happy to tell those stories. I still do social media for PR news as well as reporters have to do a multitude of things now. But um, also in Buffalo, I did start uh, their first um, social media club chapter. So um, social media club is near and dear to my heart. That was probably back in 2011, 2010. Um, so I'm happy to join you guys and uh, get back into it because it's a great group. So um, first, in terms of news, if you didn't hear, Facebook is buying Giphy and everyone is in an uproar about that today on Twitter. No one is very happy about it. Um, in terms of looking at PR and reputation, Facebook's not in the best place right now. Um, they keep trying to do different things to improve their reputation in terms of the types of communication that are being shared with the public. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so buying a brand like Giphy that everyone loves, I mean, really Giphy, I don't know if anyone has any problems with it. You, you really can't. I mean, there's an expression for everyone on Giphy, um, unless, you know, probably their only real issue, a crisis, is if it's GIF or JIF, which I have talked to people that work at Giphy, and it is GIF. So, I'm sorry to have to, you know, ruin that for the GIFers out there. Um, but so, you know, we're trying to pay attention to those type of things. Right now, we're at a point where is it reasonable to start talking about stories and start doing stories that aren't um, about COVID? And we're at that point now. We know a lot of people are suffering from news fatigue and that they probably do want to hear about some other things going on, um, the election, um, different things about the economy uh, and what brands are doing in response to that, what brands are surviving, what brands are not. Um, and how they're trying to work with their communities uh, to keep them viable. Um, so we are in that. But at the same time, even though people are in a lot of news fatigue, they are also clamoring for information and for the correct information. And so we can't fully stop uh, reporting on COVID just because a few people, you know, some people don't want to hear about it or they want to hear about other things. So we're trying to provide information and contact, content that's applicable to all of our audiences. So um, we did a piece this week on Hallmark and how for since Mother's Day was just the other day and hopefully you bought a card for your mom. I know that's a big thing in my family. Um, Hallmark does a lot of social listening and they pitched us uh, to talk about their latest video that they put out for this year, which featured a girl with Down syndrome and the relationship her and her mother have gone through from, from her being born to graduating from high school and college and moving on. And, um, you know, just trying to find the right car, the right words to say what she wanted to her mom who had taken care of her and been there for her at this special time. So Hallmark, that story that we put out for communicators was that Hallmark, their social listening is really important. They, re they received that idea um, from a fan who wrote, reached out to them on Facebook and was just there to thank them for the different types of cards they put out. Um, that social listening can also influence their product creation. Um, you know, now for Mother's Day, you can see cards for adoptive moms, for foster moms, for pet moms, for aunts who are like moms, for dads who are like moms. You know, they try to include everybody and they're listening to their customer base on social, which is most important. So we tried to put something out like that that wasn't necessarily COVID related, but related to what was going on that day. Um, really my main goal, I'm sorry, I don't have slides for you. I'm, I'm a writer. If you want to, you can look at what I do, prnewsonline.com. We are not PR Newswire. A lot of people confuse us. PR Newswire is a uh, press release distribution service. We are a news site and event site as well. Um, my main goal right now as a journalist is to really provide our audience with what they need to know to get their job done in the best way they can. Um, the information right now is changing every hour, 
every day. And it's really hard for these communicators to, it's actually really easy for them to screw up. <laughs> it's really hard for them to get things right. So they're trying to do their best and we're trying to help them with that. We're trying to help Thank these you. Oh, I'm thank sorry. You, thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation and for the speech. We are just, you know, uh, beyond the, the 10 minutes, so we have to go oh. for the next one. Thank you. Was that thank five? You. Was that five minutes? No, 10. Okay. Making sure. Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have the next uh, presentation with uh, GradCon. Uh, Grad is uh, Chief Experience and Marketing Officer of Sprinkler, and he will be talking about why social and messaging channels are essential for organization survival. Uh, Grad, thank you for joining us. You can go ahead. Great, great to be here, and uh, it's really awesome to be connected uh, to all these other people and all these other speakers. I've been listening in, it's been fantastic. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you. Awesome. I'm coming to you from Yavin 5. My X-Wing is just behind here. So just, uh, if you wonder what that is, you know, say uh, X-Wing fighter. No one's inside it right now. Anyway, so um, what I want to do is uh, take, uh, how much time do I have, Ali? Do I have 10 minutes? Yes, you can, uh, you have 10 minutes. Okay, good. So I'll, let me go for 10 minutes and then we can uh, sort of see where we net out. Um, so I wanted to, uh, let me just kind of get into uh, what I think will be um, some kind of relatively straightforward things, but I think that there's a, um, still a lot of companies that don't get this. And then I want to go into something that's a little bit unusual in terms of my perspective on where this uh, all goes, which is, um, you know, I think we've got a pretty well understood group of people here that understand we're moving from a set of traditional channels to a set of modern channels. And I, I do think it's helpful to define all these new channels, not as social, but as modern channels, because the social platforms are part of it, but the messaging platforms are also part of it and a very important part of it. In fact, I would argue that the messaging platforms are probably becoming the most part and part of the shift to modern channels. And then sort of right behind them would be forums and blogs and, and review sites. Those are they sort of starting to dominate the conversations. And all of these have in common one thing, which is that they're unstructured and unsolicited data. Uh, and the traditional channels are, are, are much more structured. The other big change between these two is that traditional channels uh, generally fall under the rubric of being broadcast channels. So they're one to many, and they're you know, me with my message saying it to you. Whereas in the modern channels, they're interactive or conversational. And so I wanna have a back and forth conversation with you. And the challenge I see for most organizations today is they're still in the mindset of the broadcast traditional channels, but they're beginning to interact on modern channels. But what they do is they'll take their programmatic display ads or their sort of messaging and they'll pound it through a conversational channel. And so it becomes not a conversation, it becomes someone yelling at you. Uh, and most people don't like that very much. And so that doesn't tend to work. You'll hear a lot of people say, I'm not sure social works. I don't know if messaging works because they're trying to essentially take one form of communication and layer it into another. And that, that's the, the kind of key thing that I see in most organizations today, which is that their customers have actually moved to modern channels, but the organizations themselves have not. Uh, Mary Meeker talks about this a lot in her stuff. Um, I love this particular slide, which it shows by generation, uh, a preferred business contact channel. And if you, if you take a look at the, um, for me, the, the thing that's most interesting is you've got the silent generation loving the phone. You know, they love that synchronous connection. But as you move up by generation, uh, the preferences move to internet and web chat, social media, and to a certain extent, you know, SMS and email. And even generation X, while not, as sort of dominant as it is in Y and Z, still very much prefer to be on the web and to be in part of an asynchronous chat motion. And so, uh, so the thing that so I think is, this is actually, believe it or not, my most requested slide when I talk to companies, they're like, oh my God, I gotta take this slide to my management. Because management's still on this synchronous mindset and they're still setting up sort of uh, you know, PBXs and call centers where people are talking to people. What's been very interesting about the last couple of months is that this is really starting to change because roomfuls of people on telephones are gonna be very hard for us to implement in a post-pandemic world. 
And so getting people to interact on digital and to work from home is going to be the where call centers are going. And it's very hard to run a PBX there. So we're moving from a lot of uh, installed uh, on-prem solutions to digital cloud solutions. So that revolution is going to be occurring. Um, this is a great question. It's just that you know, on their very small, which is going to us, but uh, Microsoft had a fantastic quarter and said that you know we had a two years worth of digital transformation in one in two weeks you know, or two months, and um, and then and then this is kind of where I want to kind of head now. So um, anything I'm posting and talking about here is is posted on Sprinkler. You can go to sprinkler.com forward slash digital talk form, uh, and that uh, we'll leave that URL up as we go through it. Uh, so 67%, the majority of people uh, in the kind of core demographic that we want to target, so they stopped doing business with the brand due to poor customer service. We've all had that. I'm never doing business with them again experience. Um, the most people expect companies to interact with them without delay, and importantly, like on the channel that they expect to be interacted with. If I tweet you, you got to tweet me back. If I send you a message, I want to be messaged back. If I send you an email, I want a reply email right away. I don't want to be waiting and it's not acceptable to wait. And most people are now willing to pay more for great customer experiences because it's very hard to get a great customer experience out there. So experience has become the new brand. And I would say that care is becoming the new marketing. And you know, we, we continue to talk about marketing in the context of messaging, which I would argue is using a traditional mindset to the way we interact. Um, we are continuing to think about social media and social marketing marketing in the traditional mindset where we're taking messages and pushing them out um, where we're publishing uh, but instead what we really need to do is think about the channels where true interaction occurs and think of them as the marketing who that is but if they wouldn't mind muting it'd be awesome and so let me talk a little bit about care. So we tend to think about care as, you know, hey, it's our customer service channel. If people have a problem, they're going to give us a call. That's a very traditional concept. But it's actually a lot of the things, you know, billing issues, product questions, ideas and feedback. We actually find with our customers that find once they start in the true interactive digital care, that about 30%, 30% of all their incoming customer care queries are actually product queries. Uh, that have tended to be dropped on the floor because they weren't care or support issues. But when you take care in marketing and marketing context, it's a, you behave properly with those queries. Because remember that 50% of your next customers are your current customers, and it takes seven times as ten to win a new customer versus keeping an existing customer. And so I would argue that in most organizations, they're massively under-exploiting, under-leveraging the care channel because it's not part of marketing. It's set up as a separate group, separate silo. Goals are completely different from marketing goals. Their goals are based on time on call, TOC, and they're based on sort of an NPS score. I wanna take your problem, I wanna deal with it quick, I wanna get you off the phone, I wanna get you off whatever channel you're on. Whereas marketing is spending millions of dollars trying to get people to talk to them. And it seems ironic that often these two groups are in buildings that are beside each other on the same campus, uh, dealing with the same customers, but not connected. The systems aren't connected because they're on different point solutions. And so I'm advertising to a customer who's on a call with someone in customer service, very irritating, also waste money from an advertising standpoint. We've got to bring these together. And I would argue that care should actually be part of marketing and part of what um, marketers are doing to sort of think about how to make sure that the total customer experience is being managed. And again, my thesis is that the most important, um, the pointy end of the spear and the most important part of the entire customer experience is customer care, which is being queried and connected with way more often with customers and particularly with modern channels to make it really easy. You wanna make sure you're on top of that. Um, the key changes here is it's asynchronous versus synchronous, single channel um, versus omni-channel, right? So omni-channel is where we're going and then single mode versus multimodal. And so in multimodal is the kind of a core insight on why WhatsApp is becoming such an important part of customer care. 
because humans tend to like to communicate in a variety of different ways with our hands, our faces, you know, our expressions, our voice, our hearing, our, we show things, we pick things up. Um, and that's what um, you can see with WhatsApp, right? So WhatsApp, I might start in text and then it's like, hey, you know, can you send me a picture of the thing you're talking about? Oh, great. You know, do you mind if we have a quick call? Okay, let's go to voice. Let's talk for a second. Great, we're back to text. Good, here's the address. You know what, I had another question. Can you send me a video? Just go around the edge of that. Great, thank you. Back to text. You know, I, you know, I got one more question. Can I just call you and call back to voice? This multimodal way of being able to express it is really important. And so that to me is where I think care will become the core marketing channel as we go forward. And so you're seeing this sort of evolution of care from an organization standpoint, from silo to marketing, um, from you know, moving from resolving customer issues to really the way to, to initiate sales conversations, from you know, sitting in legacy systems and being siloed to being information shared through the org, uh, from being reactive to proactive. Uh, ideally, especially in a SaaS world, you know, we should know when a customer's had a bad experience. Something went down, something didn't work something dropped. We should know that. We should reach out to them as customer care and say, hey, you know, I just know you just had a bad experience 10 minutes ago. Really sorry. And here's a, uh, here's a coupon for you know, an extra hour. Uh, here's a coupon for an extra product. I know we shipped something to you that didn't arrive on time. Here's a way for us to make good on that. That's how customer care should really work, right? And then the context is that you know, we've got limited profiles in CRM systems. We need to have CXM profiles that pull in all their experiences and the way that they talk about us. And uh, instead of being disconnected, it needs to be seamless. And from a cost standpoint, it's gonna be a lot less expensive running digital systems that use AI, because they can take care of a lot of customer issues with bots. And then they can also make sure that the very best work of the very best agents is shared amongst all the agents. So we have a better system overall. There's sort of three sort of general objectives. I'm gonna show you these and then I'll be done, uh, which is, you know, there are really three things that companies are trying to do. They're trying to make more money. They're trying to spend less money, so manage costs, and they're trying to manage the risk to so make sure they don't get in trouble. And so what we've done is, is we've looked across our customer base. Um, we see sort of, sort of different use cases amongst those. So in a case of, a, of, of a revenue, uh, where we wanna make care of the new marketing, um, it's like, how do we seamlessly transfer leads to marketing sales? How do we guide customers through product information? And how do you get real-time collaboration going? And overall, what this is also doing is reducing your churn, um, because as you drive a better experience, customers will tend to leave less often. In terms of reducing costs, you know, instead of having a bunch of point solutions, get to one flat solution, one unified solution. Um, let's have AI-based conversations to help the agents do more faster, and then leverage AI and bots to take routine tasks and make them something that the machine is doing instead of human. And then finally, in terms of managing risk, is really all about increasing customer satisfaction. So, you know, we use skill-based message routing to create better engagements. Uh, we have a single user interface, the agent's not switching between screens and windows, and then early warning system to allow people to see stuff before it becomes a huge problem. And that's my deck. If you've got any questions, we can go back and forth. I love to ask or to interact, but basic thesis is, you know, care is the new marketing, and we've got to think about care as the marketing channel, not as a separate department. Amazing. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for the, the care is the new marketing. I love it. And especially at this stage that we, all the brands and everyone is really, really taking care of, of their uh, clients and customers and community. Thank you, Greg. All the best. Thank you. And now we will go to our next speaker all the way from the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Ricardo Karam, he is the RK Pro Tsar and the founder of Tecrim, and he will speak on reinventing oneself and building trust after Corona. Mr. Ricardo, the mic is with you, please. Thank you, Ali. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm on 4G now. The Wi-Fi connection in Beirut is so bad, and even the electricity, you know, it might cut at any time. So I'm, I hope I'll be able to uh, uh, make you know, my, my short presentation and a brief one. Uh, safe in a safe way. So it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, digital experience and share with all of you around the world some of the thoughts that have been going through my head and the head of almost everybody over the last few months. Uh, when one thinks uh, of times we are going through and the world we are going to be living in once this pandemic 
gives ground, and we all do hope soon. Uh, one word comes to mind, which is uncertainty. We live in a world where everyone is a bit more vulnerable or weak, where everybody needs a bit more comfort. And for most, this is done online. Uh, my name, as Ali said, is Ricardo Karam, and for almost 25 years now, I've been, or I've made a living by bringing some of the world's most inspiring stories to the Arab world's TV screens. Acknowledging uh, the region's unsung heroes via a decade-old foundation I have established, and I have named Takrin, which means to honor. And sparking conversations between today's movers and shakers through forums, conferences, workshops, etc. Basically, I connect people. I connect with people through interviews, forums, and ceremonies. Needless to say, the current international sanitary situation we are facing has hit the industry I work in full in the face. Today, we're all on the cusp or point of great change in the way people interact with each other. And things have shifted significantly from what they were just a few short weeks ago. It's obvious that post-pandemic life would not look like it did before all of this started. Trends have been slowly progressing over the past few years. Now, suddenly, and all at once. And it's really very likely that there will be no going back. More and more, we're connecting online for work, for entertainment. We're checking up on people we love. We're also scrolling down endless social media feeds. But who's going to blame us for our need to be distracted? On the other hand, shrinking budgets and reduction in consumer spendings have changed priorities. Today, the best way to reach and connect with the audience is a oversaturated space filled with noise. Maybe your neighbor's attempt to bake a perfect banana bread and sometimes misinformation. We have all become content creators. People are creating and sharing photos and videos across social media platforms and record numbers. And it's these factual and personal experiences that people have come to rely upon and trust. It's this kind of experience and bond they will aim to share with their close ones, but also their brands of choices. Because in trying times, we turn to people, we turn to brands, that we trust. And today, most of the interaction is done online. But what lies at the core of this interaction is the human component, not the digital one. In fact, 87% of people say that social media posts help them decide what to buy. And 56% say that they rely on reviews to make informed online purchase decisions faster, far ahead of the product description and professional photos. One unintended yet noteworthy side effect of the current lockdowns has been the dismantling of the corporate facade. Ironically, when we're all sitting in a meeting room together, we're formal, we're stiff between brackets, we're corporate. Yet when we're doing Zoom meetings, maybe in pajamas, with the kids wrestling in the background, there is no choice but to embrace humanity again. We have discovered that we're actually all real people living real lives. And this dynamic certainty extends to brands, liberating businesses to communicate more directly honestly and transparently with consumers. This is why at every point in our post-pandemic journey, we need to remember genuine, authentic content prevails and can be a sustainable 
effective and influential way to build trust and deepen long-term relationships with everyone from business stakeholders to personal relationships. A middle ground of some sort between digital interactions that have been deemed superficial by so many and the real life bonds that bring us comfort at a time where people's trust in governments, institutions, corporations, and public figures shows an unparalleled decline this pandemic has taught us to tap into our potential, reinvent our brand experience, and work on building back trust. For instance, take the trillion dollar industry of conference organization. These gatherings have been a key way of exchanging ideas and rethinking the world. The virus outbreak has drastically changed the scene as so many others, and pushed us to do things differently, like we are today. I myself have completely changed my way of working with both my team and the public. Online interviews are now new norms. Zoom meetings fill my schedule, and every day I look for new ways to bridge the gap that distance has left between me, my team, my interviewees, the community that gravitates around my foundation and my friends. I like to believe that the core of my expertise lies in the fact I can manage to put people at ease. I can help them reveal a new side of themselves and engage in an intimate conversation despite the glaring studio lights and the camera pointed at their every expression. Trust has always been the key to unlock each one of my projects. But in the near future, we may face a world where we struggle to trust people again or feel comfortable in public spaces. What will happen to those large conferences and travel budgets and expensive face-to-face -face gatherings? Do we even deem them to be necessary or shall we be indefinitely meet via Zoom and perhaps fly to meet someone only if it's a business emergency? One thing is sure, the impact of this pandemic will reshape how we live, work, and play, possibly accelerating some of the changes this century has witnessed over the past two decades. But people will adapt. A proportion may even get so comfortable with being at home that large crowded spaces like convention centers, airports, and restaurants may begin to feel bizarre to the point of making people uncomfortable. We will be afraid for many years if someone sneezes next to us on the train, just like people were afraid of Arab culture, of Arab names, or Arab features after 9-11. Allow me to end on this note, the cornerstone of all relationships is trust. Think of handshakes, which is for most a way to establish a bond, trust someone they just met. How do we build trust in a post-handshake world where most of our meetings take place in front of a webcam? Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, amazing speech. And hopefully after this uh, Corona, we will meet again in Takrim events and uh, uh, we collapse for the people that we, uh, we honor. Thank you very much. And Thank now you. it's the time for uh, polls. So we have a second poll. Let me launch it. Please, can you go to the poll and answer the poll? Mungkin tuhun ala taswit with Will your company let you continue with, to work from home after a stay at uh, home orders are lifted? Yes, no, considering it. Okay. Very good. 
Now we reached almost 50% voted. Let's see. So when home orders are lifted, are you going back to the office or you continue working from home? I'll be staying home. Uh, <laughs> okay, we have 57%. More people, okay. Please, attendees, participants, speakers, everyone, can you go to the polls and answer our second poll for tonight? I will end it in 2015, 10, 5, thank you very much. And let me share it with you. Okay, everyone can see? We have 52% will be staying at home. 23% no, they would like to go back to the office. And 25% will be considering it. Thank you very much. Let's take a screenshot, save it, and we go to our second speaker. Amazing. Good. Our second speaker that we met also in Middle East, all the way from US, is Nina Stwick. Nina, she is a digital marketing consultant at LearnNet, and she will be talking about shifting to a digital mindset. Nina, good to see you back. Thank Go ahead. you. Um, first, I want to thank you both um, for inviting me back. I wish I was in Bahrain right now. I could almost taste the food. I, I brag about the trip every time um, anything about the Middle East comes up. I'm like, oh, did you know I went to Bari? And I talk about the people and how you know welcoming you are. So just seeing everyone, I'm just really excited. It brings back so many memories. So thank you for having me. Um, I am sharing my screen. Can you see it okay? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Go ahead. Great. You have 10 minutes. So rather than do slides, what I wanted to do is give you a couple concepts and then take take you through um, an example or a case study of that. So for anyone who's new to me, my name is Socially Nina Online. Um, I just got married, so my last name is Estwick. But um, if you want to search for Socially Nina Online, you can find me anywhere. And I know a couple of speakers talked about being searchable. Um, my motto for digital marketing is everything is searchable. So you should be creating content that's searchable and that draws your perfect client into you. So. Um, this is my website and one of the things that I do is I help people that I consider that are not so techy. A lot of times those are baby boomers or Gen Xers that really have a genius for what they do. They just don't know how to transform it into creating content that creates cash flow online. So that's what I help people with. How do you create content that's searchable that brings your clients to you? And so as you can see on the screen, one of the things that I do, I have a tool called Learned It. Like I learned it live, I learned it online, it's called Learned It. And both me and my students actually contribute a lot to this. And so um, whether it's video content or- so, Sorry, Nina, Nina. Yes. Sorry, your voice is a bit far. Can you come just- uh, Yes, hold on, let me move my microphone. Give me one second. I usually move it back because it can get too loud. I have a bi-directional mic. Amazing, good one. Is now that better? Is it, yes, yes. Okay. Very good. Right. I'll sit up a little bit. Okay, good. So these are my students as well as some, um, some of the blogs that we create. The whole goal is to create searchable content, right? And so the way that I think um, about creating content and the way that we should shift our thinking now is what are people searching for, right? What is the first thing that you do when you don't know how to do something? You search for it, you Google it, right? You look up on Instagram or Facebook or Google. And so one of the things that you do is you're gonna use this, um, I was called the customer journey because it's the first part of the customer journey. It's called the buyer's journey. And um, this is a little bright, this is really for a larger audience, but um, I thought it'd be great for this presentation is you wanna make people aware of you first and the way you do that is you aim for one person. You always hear niche down, right? Niche down, find a niche. Well, really that's all about finding one person and what problems they have. And you start there. You create content for that one particular person and you put it out on the internet. And then what you do is 
they'll get to know you. There's a number of speakers that brought this up. You want to create a social engagement on social media, right? So you're not going out there to just put out con content. You want to ask them questions, figure out if it's helping them, find out what they need, and you kind of give back. They ask you a question, you may give back. That can be an Instagram video. It can be a social media post. It can be TikTok. That's actually the case study that we're going to talk about today. I know a lot of, I saw some, a lot of Q and A's in there about TikTok, but the whole goal is to create content that solves problems and that gives you value. And you may have to rethink your content right now because there's a shift in what people are searching for and there's a shift in what people need. So if you look here, after they find you, um, they have to consider purchasing from you, right? So they're trying to figure out if you know what you're talking about, if they trust you, and the way to build that relationship, again, some of the speakers have brought this up, um, is going live and talking to them, posting questions, posting blogs and YouTube. My, my choice is YouTube. I do a lot of YouTube videos, but you want them to know that you are the answer to whatever their problems are. And then they go through the purchasing um, process. So let's talk about a case study. I'm actually gonna talk about two. One's gonna be really, I know we have our 10 minutes, so I'm gonna make them quick. So the first one is actually a blog and video I wrote years ago. And actually, I think it was about two years ago year or two, and it was how to watch Instagram live from your desktop, right? And um, at that time, it was kind of a new thing, but, um, and I forgot who, who mentioned this, but DJ, DJ D Nice has been going live on Instagram. Him going live on Instagram made me about $2,000 on YouTube alone because everyone was searching for how to watch Instagram live from your desktop, and my video showed up. So what does this mean to you? That means you create searchable content, answering questions that last. So when people actually look for items, they find you. And so what that does is it grows your audience, grows their trust in you, and they look to your site or your social media to answer more questions. And it starts them on that buyer's journey. So let's look at TikTok. Um, I know a lot of people go into TikTok not understanding what to do. And I know the thing is, I don't understand TikTok. I'm too old for it. I don't know how to dance. Um, people can't make money on it. And here's the truth. If you're going into it with that attitude, you're not going to survive, right? So one of the things that I did on TikTok is I looked at it as a way to connect with a different audience or just a way for me to show my audience who I am. Um, I think I only have one dancing video. I started doing little tips and tricks. And you know, most of us marketers will jump on a platform and try to sell, sell, sell. And my thought was, I'm not going to sell with any, to anyone. What I'm going to do is just connect with them, provide them value, and see what they need. And so what I started doing was doing um, TikTok lessons on TikTok for old people. And I literally would say, hey, old TikTokers. And I would just give them one tip of a day. So I did this for a couple of days and within a week I had a thousand subscribers or followers and within a few weeks, I think I'm up to 11,000. Now I haven't posted in a few weeks. I actually went back to kind of um, poking around at my other applications and things that I love, but my TikTokers found me. They went to YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Hey, where are you? Hey, I haven't seen you. Because I was going live and just answering their questions, right? Anytime someone would comment on my video, I would go and comment on one of their videos. I would be in their inbox. I would like their, like I really built a community where I knew people's names. So when they show up live, we were just having a conversation. So one of the things I encourage you to do before I go on with this is when you're online, just have conversations with people, figure out what they need. When you're trying to figure out what product or solution to switch from, so if you're going, if you have a live workshop or a live conference or a live anything, what you want to do before you switch it or shift to online services is figure out what your clients need right now. Because what happened with TikTok is about six people, again, I wasn't selling, really wasn't offering things, six people signed up for my video creators camp. And this is something I usually do live, but I moved it online. And so since people came from TikTok, I included an extra day with TikTok. And I'll show you that here. So I actually included an extra day with TikTok. And so what happened was those people, out of those six people, um, four of them actually continued on to my next program, right? Three of them decided to work with me long-term 
um, for the next six months. And so again, I didn't go into TikTok really focused on how do I make money? What I did was during this time, a lot of people were home. TikTok was a new thing. And I thought, let me just tell them. There's a lot of people saying we're too old for TikTok. So I said, hey, old people on TikTok, this is how you do it. So again, and I want to make sure I have enough time, so I wrap it up. So one of the things that I want to leave you with is a couple of things. One, figure out who you're talking to. Two, solve a problem. And then three, base your, your products and services on what they need now. And as long as you're building relationships on social media and you're being social, the money will come. You need to actually provide value and build relationships. Ali, I think that's my 10 minutes, so I want to send it back to you on time. I set my timer to make sure I didn't go over. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, amazing uh, speech, and uh, I'm amazed that TikTok, uh, you're doing great on TikTok. I mean, uh, um, I thought TikTok is more uh, funny, social uh, funny, and these things, and for actors and fashionistas, but you can even use it for uh, this, yani, uh, transfer, transferring uh, knowledge yeah. In, in, in digital and social media. So no, thank you very much, Dina. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, we go to our next speaker that I uh, had the pleasure to meet him as well in Middle East, John White, the founder of Social Marketing Solutions. And he will be talking about how to use PR to build your brand and business. John, good to see you again. Please go ahead. Hey, everyone. Hi, Ali. You see, hear me okay? All okay, please go ahead. All right, great. So uh, I'm gonna talk about using uh, PR to triple your influence on online and build your business. And so I started um, in the corporate world and had a, a pivot within my career and um, actually, I'm not afraid to admit that I was fired from my job six years ago. And I, I faced a really um, contentious point in my life that I could either go in the tank and feel sorry for myself, or I could pivot and pivot away from a corporate career that I was tired of, that I wasn't thriving in. And so I started my own business six years ago and I started social marketing solutions and I started building my personal brand at that time. And I went into social media and I implemented a lot of the solutions that you're heard about today on this amazing online forum that's being broadcasted around the world in so many cultures. And I'm, I'm so honored to be here and, um, being invited to speak in Bahrain a few years ago with amazing people like Nina, who I was, uh, who preceded me on this uh, forum. But none of what I'm doing today would have been impossible had I not invested into my personal brand. And so I know I only have about nine minutes remaining. And so I want to dive into uh, one of the biggest ways uh, if not the biggest way to develop a personal brand and that's through PR and most people mistakenly believe that PR is for mega influencers for people that are already famous did you did I mention that I got fired six years ago <laughs> and in that space of six years I've grown my brand I've developed a marketing and PR agency I've been able to speak in London and Bahrain, and I've developed hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. And so none of that um, would have been possible had I not invested into my personal brand and invested into getting in the media. And so I started blogging and writing articles um, six years ago and they got a lot of attention and I was really consistent with my efforts in writing articles and my uh, efforts on social media to grow my followers and engage with my audience and all of the things again you've been hearing about on this um, incredible forum that we're on today but I just wanted to go through my personal brand and see and show you all where I was six years ago compared to where I am today and the type of shift that's possible 
for people that aren't famous. I mean, literally six years ago, I was a ghost on the internet. You could Google my name, John White, and scroll through thousands of pages on Google and never find me. I mean, literally spend like your entire day scrolling through Google. And now, um, you know, I, I was fired from my job. It was always me reaching out. I'd never been published. As a matter of fact, nobody ever advised me of writing any articles myself because that's not the way they viewed me. But today I get opportunities coming to me. I'm a business owner. Uh, I'm writing for amazing sites like Inc. Magazine, Huffington Post, Influensive, Richtopia, and many, many more. I get people offering me jobs. I'm surprised how many people reach out and offer me opportunities to work at their company where it was always me just uh, you know, going on to monster.com or these other job sites and applying my resume and never hearing back from people. So this slide is all about showing what is possible. If it's possible for me, it's possible for you. And so I do want to go into um, how to get featured in the media. And I believe that with a few simple steps and strategic approaches that you yourself can be featured just like I was. And just like I get for my clients, uh, I get them featured in the media, whether it's podcast, TV, uh, quoted in um, major news sources or even niche uh, sources that are within their brand. They know their strategic audience goes to these sites. And so what I want to make clear is that it no longer matters what you say about your brand and social media and on the Internet. So too many people go on there and say, I'm a ninja, I'm the best, I'm the fastest, I'm the skinniest, I'm the most gluten-free, <laughs> whatever it may be. No one cares what you say about yourself anymore, and they care about what other people are saying about you. And that includes your customers, your peers, and it includes what the media says about you. So when you're being featured in third-party sites that are uh, singing your praises. It just matters so much more than what you see about yourself. So I want to drive that point home that, you know, rely less on your own personal sayings in content about yourself and instead put it into what the media and what other third-party sources are saying about you. So it's really important that you develop a brand story because that's what people really want to read about. They want to hear stories about um, your success, your failures, your strategies. They don't care to hear just a story about how great you are. Um, people are bored of that. Again, they've been marketed to, to death on social, especially since social media started, right? How many people do you hear that are shouting from the mountaintops about how great they are with their social media and their business. And so people are just tired of hearing that. They want to hear stories of actual successes. And I can't tell you how many um, stories of failure I've shared. And I, you know, just like I just shared with you all about being fired from my job, that was really embarrassing when it happened, but it's a story that I can now share with all of you and, and being able to pivot into a far greater place than where I was. People want to hear about that. They want to know the steps I took, what it felt like to be in the depths of um, sitting in my car as I carried my box of stuff out after being fired and let go and having to walk past the people in my audience or I'm sorry, in my office that saw me carrying that box out. Like, what happened to John? Where is he going? Why was he fired? So I shared all of those stories and the success stories and how I pivoted and what made me different. And what about your brand is actually newsworthy. So again, uh, journalists aren't going to want to feature you just because you're you. What stories do you have that can add to their specific column and their specific articles that they post and write about. 
and what pain points do you solve? That's another really good one. How do you really help your community? What is it about you that enables you to help your audience and solve problems in the business world? So once you have your story nailed down and your story items and your pitch angles that make you unique and different, you need to find journalists of who to pitch. And how do you find those people? And what I recommend is to never send your pitch to the general submission box, okay? I've had hundreds of submissions rejected and very few actually accepted just from sending to a publication's general submission box. So instead, pitch your uh, article, your story, to an actual editor, journalist, or contributor that writes there. So one-on-one -on -one inst instead of one-to-many. And to develop your list, to find these writers, there's so many ways you can find them. Use Twitter, and LinkedIn, and Google to search for their profiles using keywords. So let's say I wanted to find writers for Money Magazine because I wanted to be featured in Money Magazine because I have a financial app that's helping people make better financial decisions or whatever it is. And so I've identified money as like one of my um, target publications. Then I wanna go to and find those people, uh, those writers and those editors by using a keyword search in any search um, platform, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, you just search money and journalist or money and editor or money and columnist. And those profiles will come up and you can find uh, the writers that write for the publications that you want to be featured on. So it's really very simple um, to find these profiles because they all have public profiles. It's not like they're hard to find, even though you might think that they're um, not easy to, to locate. They're really on the internet and you can find them with keyword searches. So once you've found your list, I recommend instead of going in with a cold approach, like these people have never heard of you, they don't know who you are, they're getting just embarded um, with pitches from around the world with people that want to appear in their magazine. Instead of doing that and just being a burden to their inbox, engage with them first. So go onto their social media. Once you've found their Twitter, start retweeting them, start putting uh, comments on their posts. And here's my Sorry. golden ticket. John, tell us the golden ticket because we need to wrap it up. All right, the golden ticket would be to send them a referral for their business. So writers and uh, columnists are typically entrepreneurs. They have their own business. So if you think about sending them a referral for that business, then you're really getting a uh, foot in the door without having to cold email or cold pitch them. Makes sense, Ali? Thank you, John. Thank you very much. John, can you tell us about this Juan Blanco, your Twitter account? In 30 seconds. Sure. So, um, I'm from Colorado in the USA. Um, and the, the, the Juan Blanco 76, profile name came from when I was a exchange student in Spain as a teenager and instead of John White they called me Juan Blanco and so that's been a, a branding trademark for me that has followed me from when I was a teenager so thanks Ali. Thank you John thank you very much uh, glad to see to see you again and uh, a lovely presentation we will go thank to our next thank you very much we'll go to our next uh, presenter, Benjamin Naim. He is the man managing partner and founder of Insights LA, and he will be sharing with us the three actionable steps to start selling online. And with all this coronavirus thing, we have to sell online because everyone is at home. So, Benjamin, the mic is with you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ali. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah. We can hear you and we can see your presentation. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to uh, to be here today uh, with you. Um, so Insign is a French uh, company, as you will notice with my accent. And uh, I've been living in uh, in Los Angeles now and opening this new office for Insign uh, since a year. And um, and today I'm going to focus uh, a bit more on um, on three actionable steps to start selling online because yeah, it's a crucial moment now. Uh, at the agency, we work on the, on many different topics. You know, like uh, how to uh, how to have a different approach in order to create some consumer centric uh, brand platforms, and uh, with a real focus on speed to market and, and data driven business results. But here, we are going really to focus on the on the on the steps in order to start selling online if you are not ready, and if you are, you were not ready before the before the crisis. Um, so first, uh, I think it's interesting and to show you know the different uh, steps here, um, because you you can start uh, and create your own if you have uh, everybody has a, an IG account, an Instagram account, and, and you can do some uh, promotion very easily. But we really believe that we need first um, to do it in the right way, uh, first to to know your audience, who you're talking to. Um, and it's quite interesting also to have a, a look at what the competitors are doing online and understand by doing a benchmark, by doing an SEO audit, where are the white spaces where you would be able to have some opportunities in order to communicate your values, in order to reach your different audience. And, um, and a way also to do it a bit differently, maybe than just using you know, Facebook interests or uh, IG interests, is having this uh, community approach, this tribes approach, uh, in order to uh, really identify people that are sharing the, the same values. And, and that can be really interesting for, for your brand. When I talk about tribes, I just want to give an example here because um, what we say in, in this title is that it's true that for brands you know, that don't sell online, um, it's not because they don't sell online that they can't collect and leverage some data. Uh, in order to better understand their, their buyers and the communities that they are interested into their brands. So we, we take this example that is a tribe identification process that has been done for Patagonia, uh, showing you know, seven uh, different tribes um, relevant with the brand values and also with the, uh, all the, the communication plans that Patagonia wants to share online. So people from outdoor sport fans, fashion lovers, green enthusiasts, uh, green activists. So this is the way we think it's interesting before starting to sell online and before creating your audiences to think of, okay, who would be the best communities, the best tribes to target in order to reach our objectives. Um, the phase two will be more something about yeah, testing and validating you know, the, the creatives uh, in order to test different angles um, to test different creatives and then to be able to see, okay, what is our growth model? What are the best channels to sell? Uh, and so you are able then to activate and to scale. But first, before uh, activating, we think it's really important for you as a new brand that want to sell online to first think of your tribes, your communities, the people you really want to target. Then we are living in a special context, for sure. Um, and, uh, and I think it's interesting also to have a look at what are the different strategies that we can see, uh, both for uh, own strategy, earned strategy, and paid strategy, uh, but very quickly, because we don't have much time. Um, so the, the first one, if we look at the, um, at the own strategy, um, I think it's, uh, it's really the, the good moment you know, to get closer to your customers, to your followers, to nurture your community. Um, by discussing, by engaging with them. Uh, and so if you are thinking of selling products, testing these uh, conversational commerce uh, you know, ways by prioritizing more on quality and discussion rather than quantity. Um, email marketing is a great tool also to look at, uh, to look into uh, those days, especially, you know, because it's funny, this is a rare time when people, they are treating their inboxes uh, almost like their newsfeed. So it's also a way to share some, uh, some good uh, uh, information uh, through this channel. And live shopping sessions. Um, people are, are really uh, you know, focused when they are looking at some uh, shopping sessions. And it's a good way because the average viewing time is most of the time three times higher with live video than regular video. So if you want to uh, continue you know, selling products online, doing live session and live shopping session could be a good idea. There is a specific tool, but I'm not going to talk about uh, too much about it. But 
it's uh, it's called LifeScale, and you can check their website, and it's very easy to implement and to uh, and to start using it. Maybe something about the earn strategy then, uh, because it can be also a way for you to to make the shift from big influencer strategy towards more employee advocacy. Uh, we we see you know some brands that are involving their employee uh, in their influence marketing. We have an example with Mark Jacobs here that is asking some employees to uh, to take some pictures of them in order to present the, the different products. You can also organize some uh, yeah one-on-one -on -one consultation and and turn your employees into online uh, social sellers. And uh, and it's also maybe the moment to look into um, real people you know for influence rather than working with only big influencers and there is a, a solution that is called Zyper that uh, allows you to uh, to meet uh, real people that are really interested into your products and are, are ready to create some content in exchange for free products or other rewards for example um, and so the last part but uh, yeah last but not least i would say uh, because this is still if we have some budget you know that are uh, cut off uh, and uh, and because it's a tough time it's important not to uh, to cut everything too fast, but to re-challenge some channels. Uh, there is a big media opportunity now for CPMs, you know, on social advertising. Um, we think in terms also of creative, it's uh, the right moment to keep it simple, just to sharing your values, your identity, and also to dig into your archives uh, in order to, uh, to have some good content to share because you will not be able to, to produce new content very easily. So it's also a, a, good, a good way and a good opportunity to, uh, to reduce the production cost by digging into your archives. Um, and just to show an example, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm making a little bit of advertising for one of our clients, but we, we did this process you know, with a, a brand, obviouswines.com, that was uh, used to sell on retail shops only. And we helped them by doing all this online in order to have some now sales on, uh, on using their online website. Um, so you can have a look at it. It's a very good wine. <laughs> so th th thank you very much uh, because I think now it's uh, almost yeah 11 and 11. So thank you very much for uh, for having me today. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, those uh, you know steps in order to uh, start selling thank online. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, yeah. Benjamin. Yeah. Amazing. Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we will be going to our next speaker, um, Brandy Botner, and she is a social and influencer communications lead, global markets brand communications manager of IBM. And she will be talking about the digital decade is actually the human decade. That's interesting. So uh, Brandy, are you there? <laughs> Lovely. I am, Ali, can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you and we can see you. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm not sure if I need to share my screen uh, for I just created three slides to talk about uh, sure. the digital, the yeah, digital decade. Sure. So I'll share that while um, I get started. And so this idea of the digital decade being actually the human decade, this actually happened uh, most recently with my CEO and Will I am from the Black IPs. They had a conversation recently and they, they were talking about COVID and where we are. And Will I am is such a creator, not just with music, he's really passionate about education. And my CEO said to him, It really, if you look at technology and the role it plays, it really is not the digital decade, it's really the human decade. And it was so profound, it struck me. And Will I am was like, Yes, he tweeted about it, it was great. And so it got me thinking, I wanted to share that with this audience today as we talk about like all the things that we are doing. And so I wanna start with a quote um, about our new reality, whatever that may be, right? Whatever it looks like for all of us. And it's an interesting quote that says, the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen, just listen. And perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention. And this quote came from a professor and someone who studies alternative medicine and she looks at health and wellness. And I thought, one, this is a very profound quote. Two, May here in the US is Mental Health Awareness Month. And three, how many of us are dealing with a number of emotions as the days you know, seem to repeat themselves and as we try to serve customers and our families and our communities and everything that we're doing 
I thought this makes perfect sense for anybody who's in social media or anybody who's in digital, that social listening and when we execute social listening or when we meet our customers on social where they are and what they want, we get profound business impact, right? When we listen, that we have command centers, we have entire teams dedicated to social listening and listening to conversations. But if we think about attention, engagement, isn't that the metric that we all want? Isn't that what we want from our you know, social strategies and our tactics and our plans? We want attention. We want, and how do we get attention? But how do you get attention when there's a huge crisis within a crisis going on, right? And so I thought about, again, this idea of we were all, or at least I was, very excited about going into the digital decade, but we've now been forced to just look at the humanness that we each possess and how we continue doing what we do in times of crisis. And so I say this is the, and I have the capital, the digital decade, right? 2020, <laughs> however it started, it has become the digital decade because di digital is so critical at this moment right now. And everybody, everybody on the planet who is touched by this crisis has had to accelerate their digital capabilities, whether that's your own internal skills, your teams, shifting people to work from home, remote work, you can't leave your house. Everything relies on these digital capabilities. And so human connection is now at a premium. And we as, as human beings, we crave connection. I don't know about you, Ali, Caroline knows this, I'm a hugger. I love to hug people. I embrace, I say hello, I'm a hugger. How, how am I dealing with social distancing when I'm in the house, I'm with my mom, I haven't lived at home since high school. How do I, how do I handle as someone who craves human connection and craves hugging and I wanna hug people and see people in the times of social distancing? Well, you know what, right now, human connection, it's so valuable for our business, whether it's your employees, whether it's your clients, but we can't do it. So we're relying so heavily on technology. And if we look at technology and what we are doing and watching and consuming and information, we have never been more vulnerable than we are right now. We really haven't. If you think about life BC before coronavirus or before COVID-19, and you think about the things we took for granted, right now we are very vulnerable whether it's, again, our customers, our employees, our businesses, we now have more needs. We have more needs. There are, there are more things that we need when we can't leave the house. There are more things that we need when we can't hug and see loved ones. There are more things that we need when we can't go to a physical conference. Imagine if we were all together, Ali, if we were all at a digital talk forum at a fabulous location, together sharing our insights, networking. We all know that in the hotel bar at 10 p.m. after all you know has been said and done, a lot of magic happens, <laughs> a lot of ideas, a lot of brainstorming, but we don't have that right now. So how do you meet your customers where they are when we are all craving this human connection and we are all vulnerable at this time? You use technology, but you have to think about technology and the way we as social media marketers, as social media practitioners, as marketing communication professionals, you have to think about what we do in this digital decade that makes us more human. Again, because we are vulnerable, all the things that are happening, going back to the quote about listening, the most important thing to listen, right? To listen to what people want. And so my last slide is I, we, as, marketers and we as people, when all voices are heard, when everyone shows up as their authentic self and we listen with empathy and we pivot with agility and at being adaptable to what's happening, our need for connection is met. And so I challenge everyone to do what I call an infusion of inclusion. And for me, inclusion if you look at diversity and inclusion, you look at any of that stuff, and that this is not a diversity play, this is very much a technology play, but this is a very human play. If you look at inclusion, it really is about when all voices are heard, right? When someone feels included, it's in inclusive. 
someone shows up as their authentic self, not the version of themselves they want you to be. And I can tell you, because we are all vulnerable, thanks to this pandemic, people aren't showing up as versions of themselves. Do you think when you get on a Zoom call or when you're doing something, you're in a version of yourself? No. If you think about remote work, right? If you think about online learning, if you think about virtual doctor visits, if you can think about this forum, all of this, this is not a version of Ali. Oh, this was Ali just on Friday for the digital forum. Oh, that was Caroline just a, as just organizing as the host. No, 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 no. This is Ali as Ali is. This is Caroline as Caroline. This is Brandy as Brandy is. Because we have a need being met by a human connection. I am connected to you all right now, thanks to this wonderful event, because I need that. I need to have my voice heard. I need you all to listen to me and think that my insights matter or think that this will help you in some way. And so we will emerge out of this. We're already seeing the light at the tunnel. Whatever our new future holds, we have new ways of working, we are dependent on technologies, and we are digital. We have no other choice but to be digital. We will emerge as inclusive leaders who are practicing inclusive communications for the communities we serve and support on social media, on other platforms, on the web. We will do that as inclusive leaders because you are going to infuse inclusion in this beautiful, messy, scary, uncertain digital human decade because this impact of this pandemic and this crisis on our social fabrics is going to be lasting and permanent. And so I ask you, what are you going to do knowing that and knowing that we have this reliance on technology for us to be more human than ever before because of the vulnerabilities that we face? And so if we look at social media, and we look at all of our plans and everything that we're doing, of course, we're going to act with empathy. Of course, we're going to be adaptable and agile and change plans. Of course, we are going to be sensitive and compassionate to what is happening and going on. But for us as professionals, going back again to what we do at the end of the day, it needs to be inclusive and it needs to be human. And so with that, I have my contact information. If you would love to talk, I can talk about this forever because it's such a beautiful concept that I never considered until Will I Am said it to my CEO. And so here's my contact information. I encourage you to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, or email. But thank you so much for the time and thank you for having me. Thank you, Brady. Quick hug, Brandy. Quick hug. Virtual ah, hug. Virtual hug. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice one, Caroli. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have a very nice personality. We love it. You are a very social person. And I hope that we we'll see you more and more and more. Um, since we are here, uh, Benjamin, Vincent, can you open your cameras? Can we take a screenshot of the, since we are all here? Benjamin, Vincent, Michael. Vincent, oh, are, you, are you there? Three, two, one, we're smiling. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, so our next speaker. Where is our next speaker? Amina. I mean, Amina. I mean, mm. if we pronounce it like, uh, correctly, is I mean there? Yes, I am. Oh, you're here. Good. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, I, okay. I hope you would know how to pronounce my name. Okay. It could okay. be Middle Eastern. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, Ben Tahir, yes. Ben Tahir, okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I mean, Ben Tahir is a chief operating and digital officer. I love your title at Advantix Digital. And he will be talking about what brands should do or should know about the impact of COVID-19 COVID on social media marketing. Amazing topic. I'm very excited to see it. Thank you very much, awesome. Amin. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Can you all see my screen? We can see your screen, we can see yourself, and we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, perfect. So thank you so much, Ali and Courtney and the rest of the Social Media Club for having me today and for putting this wonderful uh, digital talk forum together. Um, I think, you know, the last speaker said it best. It would have been quite amazing if we were all somewhere, maybe in Bahrain or someone awesome. Uh, but again, that's the beauty of the world we live in as well. We can all connect from different parts of the world using the technology that's available to us. So with that, my topic today is 
about what brands should know about the impact of COVID-19 on social media marketing. The first thing I want to start with is some data. So we keep hearing about like, you know, how social media is taking over the world, how people are connecting and all the amazingness that it created. But when you look at it from a data standpoint, it literally, you feel it. I mean, when you see that 3.81 billion active users um, were online last month alone, it tells you that almost half of the world population literally is connected using social media. 99% of them are using social media using mobile. Uh, and you also see in here that the growth year over year in terms of social media usage is up by 8.7%, which represents 300 million people, which is again, almost the size of the United States alone. So social media is here and, and continue to grow year over year. Let's talk specifically about certain platforms. I'll, Facebook and Instagram have reported that like literally comparing January to April, that 40%, they're seeing a 40% increase in engagement in their platforms and also in terms of new users. So more and more people are joining all of the top platforms that we're seeing. Snapchat has reported that snaps have reached an all time high ever since its inception. And I do not have a logo of TikTok because it doesn't really report on the number of active users but their installs were up 96%, again, from January to April, and TikTok has surpassed over a billion installs. And I'll be talking a little, little bit later on TikTok alone because it's kind of a phenomena and what, like, I mean, literally what TikTok did, or what I call the TikTok revolution is quite amazing. So with social media usage at an all time high, user behavior has changed, which is kind of expected. For example, eMarketer now projects that people will be spending an average of an hour and 20 minutes per day with social media this year. Other articles are even predicting that the longer people stay home, the longer we're getting used to the new norm, the more hours we're going to be spending on social media. So with the increased usage, many social media platforms are reporting also that their ads are performing better. Snapchats, for example, volume for app ads have increased by 36%. Another thing that's, again, that comes with this is shifting audience demographic. And that's where I'm coming back to TikTok. And I think one of the speakers touched on that earlier on how people were reaching out to her and telling her, well, I'm too old for TikTok. Well, the reality is that today, the, the platform is also resonating not only with Gen Z, but also with millennials. So we're seeing more and more millennials go into the app store or to you know, going and downloading the TikTok app and starting to be actively using it. So in a way, thanks to COVID, TikTok has been acquiring a lot more users than they did pre-COVID-19. As far as in-home behavior, in-home behavior have increased drastically ever since, again, people have been on lockdown. And this chart, what this chart is saying is that the percentage of people who are expecting to stay, again, using social media or all of this in-house, I can see here, we're talking about streaming, you can see Spotify in there, are expecting to continue using it even post-COVID. Some people have been introduced to Spotify for the first time. Some people have been introduced to e-commerce for the first time. Some people have been introduced to all kinds of social media for the first time. So now they're also addicted the way that a lot of us have been in years. So they are expecting to continue using social media, even post COVID the way they are today. So not only usage is currently up, but again, many people are, are expected to continue using at a very high rate, even after the pandemic. And this is what I was trying to deliver in this slide. One thing I want to touch on is paid social. Paid social is a big player, as you guys know. So one thing we are seeing is a lot of advertisers beginning of March, started pulling their ad spend. For instance, Snap ads revenue is down 25% in March. Facebook ad revenue for 2020 is down almost $16 billion, which is 19% lower than their previous forecast. With that, CPM on Facebook are down 41% because there's a lot less competition. So unless we start seeing an increase in, you know, again, advertisers bringing back the money, CPMs are gonna continue to decrease. Um, 
Kinshu, which is a technology partner of ours, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with Kinshu, are, are saying that the average decrease in CPM is 13%. So there is actually an amazing opportunity today to advertise, especially depending on the vertical that you are in, either to educate or to introduce people to your product. If your sales cycle is anyway long, you should be talking to people because now there's also the overlap that we usually have in terms of the audience targeting isn't, is really low because again, think of the certain verticals are not advertising at all. When you think about the airline or when you think about the travel and those are historically very, very big spenders. So all of this audience overlap that we would experience before we're not having now. So it's still a very good time for advertisers to go, depending again on the vertical that you are in and to advertise and educate. And, and continue the conversation because CPMs are extremely low. And this is definitely something that we haven't seen in years, especially how social media has been growing year over year. Another thing that is actually more in the good side, CPMs are lows, which is good for us as advertisers. That means we can reach to more people with spending less money. The other thing is actually engagement. So Kantar study shows that uh, engagement is up by 61% over normal usage rate pre-pandemic. So again, people are spending a lot more time on social. They're engaging with a lot of content. I'll give you an example. One of the largest single day increases in mention on both uh, Facebook, I think, and Instagram was when the New York mayor went out and, and talked about how they're going to be shutting down cinemas and theater and, you know, like, again, and, and how the US, again, Trump announced that they were gonna be closing the border. So around that time frame, we've seen some of the highest engagement with any content related to COVID to date. So a lot of people were out there trying to find the information and instead of going and Googling information, they will literally stay on Instagram and on Facebooks of the world to get that information. So the engagement rate was extremely high and it continues to continue being really high. Another data I want to share with you guys or some information that, or things that we're noticing in the industry is that consumers actually are strongly approving of brand talking to them as long as they're providing them with information, tips for dealing with COVID, if they're running any promotions or coming to them with payment flexibility. And of course, I'm talking a lot about the United States. I'm not really sure about how it is in, in the rest of the world, but I can tell you from mortgage companies to auto um, car dealers, everybody's trying to work things out and they're reaching out a lot of their customers with either promotions to encourage them to come and buy or just work out deals with them to allow them to be more flexible in terms of payment. So consumers are actually okay with that conversation. What they're not okay with is brands that are reaching out to them as if it's business as usual without really touching on the hard times that we're going through. Unemployment is up to, I think, as we have started, 36 million Americans are unemployed. That, that's a fact. So when you're emailing me about buying a new pair of jeans and you're not taking into consideration that I just lost my job, I'm probably going to get really annoyed if I get that email. Something that brands should also consider is being transparent, informative, and also to add in value. Here are three examples that I wanted to share with you. The first one is from 3M where their CEOs I uh, posted on LinkedIn where he was talking about what are the actions that they are taking as a company, how they're willing, you know, giving back to the communities, helping their employees, how their financial are. So he was extremely transparent in that messaging. Another actually brand that did a fantastic job being transparent is Airbnb. When they had to lay off 25% of their employees, the letter from Airbnb's CEO is literally a case study for all of us to learn from as he was as transparent as he could be. Uh, without really pissing off all the VCs that are backing him. The, so the second thing is be informative. People are looking for information. Tell me about you know, what's going on, where, for example, what are the companies that are hiring today? What should I expect in terms of marketing changes or what are the new products that are out there? People are looking for that. And the third one is added value. Nike definitely nailed it with... Um, I think their hashtag of play inside where they were, they knew people were feeling lonely. We were all, you know, we're kind of all inside. So what they did is they literally, you know, started this whole hashtag to encourage people to exercise at home and, and, and it took off and then big athletes joined the movement and it created this amazing engagement where all they were trying to do really is add value as a brand and, and they won the game there. 
So what are some of the takeaways from my presentation today? One is that users are more active than ever. So people are online and spend a lot of time, time in social media. Engagement and reach is cost effective. Uh, again, CPMs are low and they're gonna continue to be low. So this is a great opportunity to go online. And if you, again, depending on your vertical, if you are able to advertise this to go and continue the conversation with your clients. And the last one is be transparent and informative during these hard times. Talk to people, we're all on the same boat. It doesn't matter if you're in Bahrain or Morocco or China or, or, or the US, we're all in this together at the end of the day. So there's nothing to hide. Let's just be transparent, be informative and provide value. And with that, uh, I think I went a little bit more than the 10 minutes. Thank you so much again. And uh, I have my Twitter handle as Thank well you. as IG. So please feel free to follow me, hit me up on LinkedIn as well. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was amazing presentation and definitely the marketeers will benefit from it. Thank, Thank you. you and Thank you uh, I'd like to go back to uh, everyone's camera. Uh, we take one more um, screenshot. Can you stop sharing the screen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, oh, done. Perfect. Very good, very good. Okay, Vincent is still, uh, <laughs> silent but anyway smile everyone cheese good Ali. if i took it i got yeah. one you got one okay excellent amazing thank you very much guys let me go to this to the next one before we go to the next one let's do a small poll again we have our third poll um let me launch it launched Okay, so uh, everyone, please go to the polls and answer our third poll for tonight. How does senior leadership within your organization value social media since COVID-19? Is it leadership sees more value or leadership sees it's, it's the same or less value? Okay, okay, okay. Everyone, please answer quickly. We have three speakers to go. Good, good, good. We have almost 60% answers. And if you more answers, 10 seconds, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. And I'll be sharing the results. Everyone see the results. They said leadership sees more value, 67%. Amazing. So we need to invest more on social media. All right. So our next speaker is, da -da. our next speaker is my partner in success during the last, I don't know, 12 years. Ernesto Verdogo, the co-founder and CEO of Speak Internationally, and Ernesto will talk about how to connect with people now and post COVID-19. Ernesto, good to see you back. The mic is with you. Open your mic. Okay, I'm unmuting you. All right, go ahead. Awesome to, awesome to see you guys. It is, uh, let me just get my clock going. And here we go. So awesome to see you, Ali, as usual. Always fantastic to work with you. I will not be doing a presentation. I will actually be going back in time to tell you, uh, share a story, because that's basically the way that we have been communicating for a number of centuries. And I think it's important that I go into that. And you're going to be learning quite a lot of information. So make sure to take some notes. So my story starts by telling you that we are living in a brave new world. And that, of course, should not be news to you because, of course, we are still in lockdown. Today, for me, it's my 60th day in lockdown in Houston, Texas. And I think we're going to continue like this already for a while. Now, my story starts in February 12th, 2020. I was flying from Dubai to Mumbai, and I was going to be a speaker in the World HRV Summit. That day was the first day ever 
that I was confronted with people wearing masks uh, in, in during the travel. I mean, I, it was quite shocking. So, of course, I didn't really uh, begin to understand what was going to be happening uh, one month after. So one month after I came back here to the to the States and then I, I had to drive to Mexico because I had to renew my uh, visa, my U.S. visa. And uh, I was just barely made it out before they actually closed the border. When I arrived to uh, San Antonio, Texas, I was driving from the uh, east part uh, of, uh, sorry, from the uh, west part of Texas in El Paso. I arrived to the hotel and I saw President Trump saying that all the flights were actually canceled. And that's when the whole, um, whole story with the COVID-19 went uh, on. I uh, was a, a little, I mean, I didn't really understand what was going to be happening, but I knew that we were going to be going on lockdown. And uh, what I did is I started thinking, well, things are going to change dramatically. I mean, life as we know it, it will uh, never exist again. Basically, life will never be the same again. And I compared it to uh, 9-11 2.0. I immediately contacted all my speakers. I work with a number of different speakers and I said to them, well, you know, we have to change because we are going to be digital. There's not going to be events taking place for a long time. At those days, I mean, I was just making this thing up because I was just basically trying to figure out what was going to happen. So I told them, well, you know, we have to figure out how to uh, be in front of people because if we're going to be in seclusion, if we are going to be in confinement, people are not going to see us. And of course, we have to be using social media, but we have to be using social media in a complete different way that we have been using it because social media has also changed completely. And that's why it was just really important for me to understand what was going to be uh, happening. And this is exactly what I did. What I did is I talked together, I talked to uh, one of my partners there in Bahrain, and I said, you know what, most people, what they're going to start doing is they're going to start uh, sharing memes, and they're going to start sharing all sorts of information of how they are feeling in, uh, in, in this confinement. And if you see right now in social media, this is exactly what most people are actually uh, sharing. Now, one of the things that I realized was that I really need to get into the mind of people in social media. So what I started doing is, you know what, I've seen that, uh, I see that Trevor Noah, I've seen that uh, Stephen Colbert, I've seen that all the comedians are actually now doing their shows from their home. So what I did is we put together a, uh, a TV show that is called the, the uh, Toilet Paper Diaries. And uh, in the Toilet Paper Diaries, and the reason why it's called the Toilet Paper Diaries, it was because when it got started, was basically the, uh, the stories of what was going on with people fighting for, uh, for toilet paper. And through 50 days nonstop, we were communicating exactly at 12 o'clock noon, 9 o'clock in the evening, Dubai time. And we started growing an audience from... Uh, from uh, uh, zero, because it was the first episode, there was nobody but me and my partner talking, until about 3,000 people watching us every day through Facebook Live. And this, of course, I think it was an incredible, an incredible uh, experience, because, of course, we started really understanding not the fact of sharing only with social media, but more importantly, sharing while thinking that we were a broadcasting company. And this is actually one of the things that I want to recommend to you. Right now, everybody talks about the new normal. Everybody talks about uh, all these bits and pieces doing uh, meetings with Zoom and all these things. And yes, of course, we know that we are in that environment. So the question is, if you want to actually be uh, seen in social media the way that you deserve to be seen in social media, you need to actually take it more strategically. So one of the things that I recommend is that you actually uh, have a regular, uh, a regular live session. I would actually call it a web TV show, if you will. And you do it on a daily basis by basically, by basically doing it all the time at the same time. Why? Because of course, the more, the more frequency that you have, the more effective this is going to be. This is going to actually let people know that you are there. Now, what are you going to be talking about in this uh, show? Well, basically industry news. For example, in my case, 
I am in the speaking industry. Right now, all speakers are really affected because they are, uh, no, there are no events. So how can we uh, actually be in, in top of mind of event planners, of uh, everybody right now? I mean, I have been in, 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 uh, uh, in television shows. I really have not, literally not stopped. People contact me because they want me to have them in, the, in their podcast. They wanted me to have them in their meetings. They want me to, have, they want me to be in their summits. And this is, this is not, I have not done anything else but actually doing this with this show. So make sure that you create something like that. Share industry news. Play the role of a DJ. Don't really have, you don't have to create the content. Basically, uh, use someone else's content and share the content. Well, look at what is happening here. Look at what is happening here. Tap into your network and make sure that everybody comes live through that network. And this is exactly what we are doing, trying to help people understand in how by using uh, uh, Facebook Live and, and, uh, and uh, social media correctly, you will be able to have a lot of notoriety, which is exactly what you want now. This is what is very interesting. Right now, President Obama is also having his show in Instagram, which is great. Press, I mean, um, uh, Vice President Biden is running his campaign in the exact same way as we are doing it. So do you think that this is effective? Do you remember in the year 2012, when, in, the, in the year 2008, when Obama won? The reason why he, he won was because he was using uh, social media strategically. So if you want to really thrive in this economy right now, what you need to do is you need to learn how to do it strategically and not sporadically. That is the most important thing. Because remember, people are in, in seclusion, so you need to be seen. Now, this is the most important thing. We all have our telephones. I have here my telephone. Your telephone should be your tool of creation, not your tool of consumption. That's why it's so absolutely critical that you keep on doing this. So let me just uh, uh, share with you the strategy that you basically need to use to do this. First of all, if you're going to be doing this, think yourself as if you will be Oprah or think yourself as if you will be a DJ and you will be basically using someone else's content to actually bring news to your uh, to, to different uh, to different communities make sure that you learn how to use tiktok make sure that you also learn how to do virtual training experiences and this is exactly what i'm doing instead of doing zoom calls and webinars zoom calls and webinars that's what 99 percent of the people are doing but if you learn how to do this kind of of interactivity, you will be a lot more successful. This is exactly what my recommendations uh, are all about. In fact, one of the things that I also ask you to do is learn how to use these four tools. These four tools are going to be super powerful because, of course, you don't want it only to be in the let me, let me be seen, but you also want to be able to create communities. The tools that I'm using, and I am thinking like if I will be a teacher also. So I recommend you that you use Google Classroom. You can also use Edpuzzle. Edpuzzle. You should also use Loom, L-O-O-M. And the other one, which I think it's absolutely great, is Socrative. These are the tools that you really need to use in order for you to start creating virtual training experiences and to start really making a big impact in your social media. By the way, if you want to connect with me and you want to know how to create uh, virtual, training, uh, virtual training experiences, go to toiletpaperdiaries.com so that you can see our show or contact me directly on Ernesto, E-R-N-E-S-T-O -E 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 dot today. And that's exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you very much. You nailed it for 10 minutes. Exactly yes. 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amazing. I, I like it. Well done. Thank you very much, uh, A.V. Uh, let me go to the next one. Also, the next speaker, I met him in Middle East in Bahrain a few years ago, Jeff Gabbard. Jeff is a founder of the Superhero Institute, and he will talk about how to become a remote work superhero. And I know that you are now a superhero dad. So congratulations on your baby. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Am I all good? We can hear you, and we can see and watch your uh, slide but it's black all right it's uh it's coming up in just a moment just gotta okay. get it in the right place because i'm actually going to show you guys a, a pretty cool nifty little tool that you may not have seen before so okay. i'm in a slightly different way than and probably how others have done theirs 
All right, so here we are. Y'all ready for this? Because let's get started. So first of all, before I get started, um, can you see my screen yet? No, we can, we can see you. Yeah, give me one second. Let me go back to trying to, I thought I had it, but I didn't. All right. Okay. Here we go. No, again, uh, you, you, you took it to the left yep. or to the right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There we, we go. Can, Okay. Oh, see again. Now? Nope. It I mean, went again. It looks like it's going. It says I'm screen sharing. Am I not? No. No, you can't see it? No, we can't. The, okay. Now we can see. Yes. You can no. see my face. We can see you, but the screen is uh, keep going to the left. <sighs> killing me here. Hold on. Not you. The, the software, obviously, killing me. All right. <laughs> We're gonna do it this way. Here we go. Can you see me now? We can see you, but not your screen. Ah, we can see the screen. Yes. Cool. Okay. Right. Don't panic. Go. Good, good, good. All right. So let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna set my timer 10 minutes. I'm gonna try and come a little bit under, but 10 minutes. Okay. We only got 10 minutes before I even get started. I just want to say thank you, Ali. You are so awesome for putting something together like this. The esteemed uh, other speakers on here. Y'all are some incredible people. So it's always good to see all your faces and. Um, really just appreciate being invited to this. So today I'm gonna to run through uh, a presentation that I put together called uh, How to Become a Remote Work Superhero. So let's get started. The thing is, is that this pandemic sucks. We can address that as the elephant in the room. Like nobody likes this. I mean, if you're an extrovert like me, this is like killing you. And um, you know, there's a lot of things about it that are good, but I think universally we can say that this is an adjustment because we are all trying to figure this thing out together. We're all trying to figure it out as we go along. This is unprecedented to be home for this amount of time and trying to figure out exactly what it is that we're supposed to do with this time at home. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people in the, uh, in the chat that can relate to what I'm saying. If you can, post something in the chat window or give a thumbs up or whatever you feel like doing, whatever you can do in this Zoom meeting. Uh, but today I'm gonna do you a solid, I'm gonna give you a playbook of what exactly to do in this time that you are stuck at home where you're trying to figure out like, what should I be doing? This is a totally new normal for us. What should we be doing, right? So today is how to become a remote work superhero. And since this is Social Media Club, I think probably the best place for me to start is, of course, on the topic of social media, which I'm sure we've been talking about a little bit today. Now, I know a lot of the other speakers have covered a vast array of different topics. You've gone into data. You've looked at the trends that are going on. I'm going to keep mine fairly high level and strategic uh, because I want to encourage you to think from the perspective of when you're working at home, what are some of the things that you can do with this time at home related to your social media? And, um, you know, as, as some of the other speakers have talked about, there's different different networks that you can adopt and things you can do. But I'm going to talk again very theoretically about this. So these, if you saw me uh, speak in Bahrain, I showed you this image, which is the five elements of social media. And this is the framework that I use to design social media strategies for virtually any size company, whether you're a one person shop or you're a billion dollar entity. These are the five elements that I'm always looking at and I'm applying them based upon what you're trying to accomplish as a business. So I'm gonna quickly run through them and then I'm gonna talk about how you can use this time to go through each and every one of these aspects and elements of social media so that you can improve, you can provide value to your company, you can provide value for yourself. The first is listening, and that's basically just research or social listening, uh, running searches and seeing what's going on out on the web. And when you listen to that, you're going to have information coming your way. Then you can create content to meet that need. So if people are talking about certain things or asking about certain things, when you're listening, you can create content that's actually going to meet the needs of those people. And the interplay between that listening and content, when you're listening to what your uh, audience is saying and you're creating content for them or they're creating content and then you're responding to that by listening, that is what I call engagement. And when there's not enough activity happening, you use promotion, things like social ads, billboards, business cards, networking events, whatever. You go out there to try and bring people in here to start creating content that you can listen to and talk about, or you put your uh, content out there and try to get people to uh, get more visibility with that type of content. And then you can measure all of these different things. So that's a high level look at it. So what should you do with this time that you're at home? Well, I would suggest now is a really good time for you to start doing that research that you've been putting off. So for instance, I noticed out of 46,200 results, there are no results for Jeff Gibbard Handsome. How is that even possible? I know my wife blogs about it just about every day. So taking this time to go out on the web, do some research, whether it be on Google, using Twitter search, going into um, 
Amazon reviews and seeing what people are saying about your area of expertise by looking at the books in those categories, looking at different podcasts and seeing what people are talking about, doing that sort of research to figure out what's going on in my industry, what's happening, what's important. That's a really good use of your time. But after you're done with listening, you got to get into the content. And a lot of the time that you're going to be at home, it's going to be more difficult to create actual content the same way you would if you had your team around you, if you had the resources. I'm here stuck at home trying to figure out different ways that I can make presentations more interesting, how I can create videos. Videos. I got this really kick-ass camera right here. It's really awesome. Um, but, you know, one of the most important things you can do with this time, since we're all kind of sitting around trying to figure out how to organize our time, is build that content calendar. And it's something that I actually took about two hours of my day today and just started going through and creating status updates, starting to ideate around different blog posts. I can create different videos, different podcasts. It's a really great time to catch up on that because I'm sure a lot of you have been saying, I'm going to do it, but then you actually haven't done it. Now is the perfect time to do that. The next is engagement. So you've got all of these people sitting at home and engagement is on the rise as some of the stats from previous um, speakers have shown. And if all of these people are sitting at home and consuming content and looking for new things, that's your opportunity to meet some new people and try and take those relationships into a new direction. So it's a good opportunity since people are more engaged on social right now to meet new people. Then there's uh, productivity, or I'm sorry, promotion. And uh, I just have to zoom in on this because I made this little sample ad and I'm just super in love with it. But um, promotion, it's time that you actually think about running those social ads that you've been putting off. Now is a good time since people are at home and because uh, cost per impression is down and a lot of the ad metrics uh, are down for these companies, it means you're going to be able to get attention at a less expensive price than you normally would. So now's a really, really good time for you to be experimenting with those social ads. And I don't have time to get into how you do that effectively, but if anybody is interested, you can certainly reach out to me and talk to any of the other speakers that are here that have mentioned social ads. There are ways to do it where you can do it really effectively. But now's the time to start playing with that. And then for, finally, out of those five, you want to dig into your analytics. Start looking at what's the content people are looking at on your website. Start looking at what are the different posts that you've been putting out there that have been getting the most traction. Now is the time since you have the time at home. It's a little less quiet. You have less people walking over to your desk. Start looking at those numbers and figuring out what should I be doing next? What sort of changes can I make and what sort of recommendations can I bring to the people in my leadership team? So it's a really good time basically to catch up on each of those five different different areas of social media, listening, content, engagement, promotion, and measurement. Start making a plan for what you're going to do and put it into action. Now is the time to do it. And just for, uh, for the sake of saying it, if you're having one of those days where you don't feel like doing stuff, just take the day off. It's fine. No, maybe not entirely, but give yourself the space because this is an entirely new space for all of us. And if you're having one of those days, your mental health is very important and you're not going to be at your best unless you have that clarity to bring your best to your job. So I would strongly advise that if you're having one of those days where you're just not feeling it, you know, just push the time to later or something like that. Okay, so now we've talked about social media and I only have about three minutes left and I wanna actually touch on something that is super important to me that I think is equally as important with this time and it can be applied to whether you wanna learn a new language or whether you wanna be effective in social media in any area of your life. I wanna uh, really show you guys this framework that I came up with that I think can be really, really helpful for your ability to level up in virtually any area of your life. So I call it the superhuman framework. This is a framework that allows you to level up in any area of your life, and it's five interrelated abilities. And these five-part frameworks are going to allow you to essentially take the limits off of whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. And since you're at home, now is the perfect time to do it. So I'm going to show you what the five-part framework is. You want to learn more about it, you can check out superheroinstitute.org. This is not a pitch, but it's more of a uh, call to action call to adventure, that if you want to actually become incredible at something, these are the five elements that you need to learn. And I'm going to explain them along the way. So the first one is going to be learning. Learning is where everything begins. You want to get good at TikTok, like some of these people have said, go watch a course on Skillshare. Go talk to somebody who's really good at it. Tinker around with it. Play with it. But learning is the basis of everything. Some of the things that I would recommend you do with this time, take a speed reading course. It's been one of the most incredible things that I've done in my entire life. In fact, I listen to my audio books at three times speed as well. And if you can tell by the speed I'm talking, I do everything fast. But these are things that you can do that allow you to open up new opportunities. But it's not enough to just learn about something. You then have to actually apply thought to it. You can't just regurgitate information 
information over and over and over. You have to process it and think about it critically. That's where thinking comes in. This is about motivation. It's about clarity. It's about focus. It's about motivation. It's about all of these different things and your ability to think creatively and critically about the information that you distill and take in. The next is communication, which is essential to anything social media related. How many of you have taken the time to actually think about the headlines you're using on your copy? How many of you have gone through and looked at your website copy or the calls to action that you're using or even what you write inside of your status updates to make sure that it's optimized for action. Start breaking these things down and working on your ability to communicate because we're all communicating digitally now, which is a lot different than when you're in a face-to-face -face meeting, shaking hands, you know, talking to people, reading body language. So you have to get really excellent at communicating no matter what you want to be good at in this world. And if you want to build a movement, if you want to make something really big happen, you have to understand leadership, culture, teamwork, team building, because you can't do anything great alone. It always comes to the interactions you have with other people on your team and your ability to make things happen. And even once you have that, once you've learned, you've critically thought about it, you are expert at communicating it, and you're an incredible leader, you still need to realize it. That means put it in action. This is about uh, planning plus focus plus action. And it's about productivity and project management and efficiency. And when you start to master these skills and apply them to the things that you've learned, the things that you're thinking about, the things that you can communicate, and the leadership that you aspire to have in the world, you have the framework mastered. That is the superhuman framework, and I hope that you all take it to heart and try to do something with that in the time that you have at home. It's 10 minutes on the dot. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Well done. Um, you took the 10 minutes and you shared amazing presentation that I think everyone will need that presentation. What, what tool you use to bring the camera and uh, it's, it's amazing. Okay, cool. So I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, it was one of the things I wanted to get to, but even talking fast, I didn't have a chance to. One of the things that I did in my time at home in, in the model of learning in the superhuman framework is I'm trying to figure out how I better serve my clients virtually. And one of the things I learned to do is use presentations with Prezi. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Brian uh, Fan. Yeah. But Brian Anzo, definitely somebody that you should all follow in the world of social media, but he's real cutting edge on live streaming, virtual presentations and things like that. I've seen him using this tool and I started playing around with it. I'm not kidding you, Ali, only three days ago. I have presentations I'm working on that are even more like visual and like there's things popping up on the screen and coming back and down. It is a really great tool and it takes you out of that just like, here's just my slides thing. And you can actually see me and how I'm interacting with you. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. That goes also a good point. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, before we go to the last uh, uh, presentation, uh, we have the last uh, poll. Where can everyone please go to the poll and answer our uh, last question? What topic would you like to see in our next SMC talk? Do you would like to see more dedicated workshops or panel discussion, or do you want to see same what we had, the 10 minutes talks like a TEDx. So please everyone, can you vote? So we can arrange our SMC talk. Good. All right. We had almost 60% voted. So closing it in 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, five, four. Guys, a few more. Thank you. I'm sharing the results. So 55% says they want dedicated workshops. 29% says panel discussions and 39% says 10 minutes talks. This means we should do everything. <laughs> Caroline, <laughs> let me take a screenshot, save it. And I'd like now, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the mic is with Caroline to do the closing uh, presentation and uh, cl the closing ceremony. Caroline, please go ahead. Thank you, Ali, and thank you everyone for sticking with us uh, throughout the afternoon and uh, our speakers who have many have stayed with us throughout the day. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, Michael Krigsman. He is the industry analyst and host at CXO Talk. And for this final talk, we are going to do just a little bit of a 
um, interview with some questions and I'll be asking him a few. If you have any, please shoot those in the chat or the Q&A and we will do our best to get to them. All right, Michael, uh, do you wanna take a quick minute to give a more full intro and then we jump into the questions? Great, yes, uh, thanks so much. I've been enjoying the talk so far. So I'm an analyst and run something that I founded called CXO Talk, cxotalk.com. We do interviews with top business executives in the world. They tend to be C-level executives from the largest organizations. And the focus is on digital transformation and disruption. And of course, for us, social media is essential. It's a core part of what we do. Great. So um, can you tell me um, why, why should social media professionals be friends with the chief information officer? We, we've been talking, we talked earlier about how senior leadership is starting to really see the value of social media, especially now in the pandemic. I think a lot of their eyes have been opened. Can you share some advice for social media managers? in that regard as far as better connecting with leadership. Yes, I, I think it's a very important point. The Ernesto spoke earlier about being strategic when it comes to social media. And that means thinking about social media, not just as external outreach, but also establishing relations inside the company so that the, the position of social media will be accepted and embraced more fully. And I think that gets to the, to the point you were just making about the rising import, the recognition of social media being increasingly important. As far as the CIO and as far as IT goes, that's a really good place to start for a couple of reasons. Number one, well, first off, I think it's pretty obvious they're the folks that have the technology, right? We're all running on technology and it's just good to have good relations with the people who run the computers. You never know when you're gonna have a problem with software, when you need to buy software. So I think it's, I think it's really good just to embrace those folks for that reason. But even more importantly, I think IT needs the help. There's a perfect opportunity to develop, you know, with social media, we talk about engagement and relationship. There's a perfect opportunity to develop a relationship with people that really need it. IT right now is focused on transitioning from work in the office to work at home. And they're kind of the unsung heroes managing this infrastructure. So there's a tremendous opportunity to develop a relationship because they need what you have which is communication skills. Absolutely. And what would you suggest? Uh, a lot of our members are either self-employed as consultants and freelancers, uh, many work for nonprofits, or they are essentially the army of one within their internal organization. How, how would you recommend that they start forming more of those relationships if they don't already exist internally? I think the first step is to establish the, the target or the, the team or the person with whom you want to develop that relationship. Now, that can be, the, that can be IT as we're talking now, can be folks in marketing, can be folks in finance. Again, I think, I think IT is a really, really good target. And that means understanding what are their concerns, right? What are they focused on? What are their concerns? And where do they need assistance? And I can tell you that, again, from, from an IT standpoint, I have yet to meet a, a, a CIO or an IT leader that doesn't have some interest in the, the organization understanding what they're doing. Absolutely. Right? So, so start by identifying that need and figure out how can you get them to trust you? Because trust is always an issue because it, after all, what social media managers do, what you guys do is by definition public, 
right. And for somebody who's not used to that, that means take a risk. You're asking right. them to take a risk by talking to you. So you need to establish trust. That's number one. Okay. And then number two is find a way to let them know that you appreciate, that you understand what they do, that you recognize it, that you appreciate it, and that it's important. You recognize it's important and you have this arsenal, and this is really the key, right? You have this arsenal called social media that can help them get the word out about what they're doing and recognizing them and their work. Great. And what would you say that CIOs care about the most right now? I think I was going to, you know, during what, this unprecedented time. Yes, during these unprecedented, I was going to say, what they care about is surviving. <laughs> but to drill down a little bit, a little bit into that. So, so the CIOs and, and IT in general have really had to turn on a dime because all of us were, or many of us were working at, in offices and now they have to be managing, they had to transition and manage now this infrastructure of, if it's a large company, it can be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people potentially working at home with all of the security implications of that, right? Previously, they were focused on security of their perimeter, their firewall, all of that stuff. Now, every single person working from home is a security, a, a node, a potential security breach it's on their network. Decentralized versus everybody, yeah. Right, I've exactly. A little bit about that. We've, uh, yeah, lots of, very cool. Um, what would you say that the I, IT department or the CIO, what do they need from the social media team? Help them get the word out. Okay. Basically, that's what they need. Their focus is technology. It's not on out, outward communication necessarily. The really good ones, by the way, IT leaders, the really good ones are excellent communicators, mm -hmm. but they can always use support. And the ones who are, who are more technical, oftentimes, you know, their, their focus has been technology, they're technologists. And, you're and I, I would, I would say a lot of my interactions with uh, IT, they, they tend to be very direct, very matter of fact, and social media team, maybe they can help them soften that message up, make it more friendly, maybe easier to understand, and they could work together to find that. Yeah, yeah I think the right term message. Yeah, help them craft the message and tell the story. Right. I think that's, you know, that's, that's what's missing, that, that matter of fact kind of communication doesn't, it's transaction based, transactional, right? right? Well, my computer doesn't work, what's wrong? Help them build a story around what IT is trying to do strategically and share that story. That's where I think there is a weakness. Okay, very cool. Anything else you'd like to add? I know we are a little over, but um, I think we, we did all right overall, considering we had 20 speakers and plenty of uh, plenty of things to talk about today. Ali, do you have anything else you wanna add before we wrap up with Michael and finish up or? Um, I'm good. Please go ahead. We're good. I just would like to uh, thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, Caroline. Uh, we had an amazing 3.5 hours, you know, it's been almost th three and a half hours since we started uh, uh, this forum. And I would like to thank Caroline for putting up all this lineups and, you know, all the technical things and logistics, you know, uh, it was an amazing uh, hard work from you in the last few days. Um, uh, Lewa did much. a lot as well, and, and yeah, and Lewa from Middle East also added um, all this uh, logistics parts in the back. So thank you very much, uh, Caroline and Lewa from the Social Media Club Board of Directors. Thank you very much, all the speakers. Thank you very much for our sponsor, Dime Global. And Vladimir, you would like to say something? Yeah. Yeah, Ali, I wanted to say thanks for inviting me to your uh, talk. You know, it was my first experience sharing my expertise with such great leaders. And, uh, you know, I have been in this journey for like uh, six, seven years. And uh, I have managed to build great uh, social media networks. I put my soul and heart because uh, 
of these colleagues, you know, because when I started my journey in 2014, I had zero follower and uh, what I have in 2020, is, uh, it is unprecedented and uh, truly I'm, I'm very grateful from the bottom of, bottom of my heart because it is very Thank hard you. for it is very hard for Europeans to achieve what I do. And uh, uh, I, um, I owe so much to the United States, to the UK, and uh, uh, I will be, I joined so many trade associations and uh, such organizations, and I will be organizing so many events throughout the world because I- Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We would love to have you as a member of yeah. Social Media Club. Thank you. And we would I would love to plug membership one more time before people start jumping off but if you want to visit socialmediaclub.org slash membership you can there's a number of different membership levels that we have available that may suit your industry and sector as well as your budget if you'd rather pay monthly or annual or pay ahead and get a discount we've got it all uh, use code SMC talk for a one-time 30% discount on any on any plan, any price. And we would love to have you as a member of our organization. Oh, I know your that. membership, I'm kind of talking to everybody right now. Uh, we would love to have you join and be a part of our organization. Your membership support enables us to continue doing more events like this and gives us the resources and infrastructure to be able to, you know, pay our Zoom bill and pay, uh, uh, you know, our web hosting fee and all sorts of things that it takes just to exist online. As many of you know, social media, people like to think that it's free, but we all know better. So we would love to have your support. And we will certainly be sharing more information in our follow up. We will be uh, absolutely sending around the recording. Thank you, everybody, for asking. We will be sending that around our the slide decks that we have received from speakers. We will continue gathering those and we'll make those available to you as well as they come in. And uh, stay tuned. We absolutely hope we can do another event like this again. We will certainly be exploring other formats, dedicated workshops, maybe more uh, lengthier interviews with some of our speakers. Uh, some of them we already know we wanna bring back few longer sessions with. A lot of our goals behind this event was to really gauge your interest and see if it's something that, you know, it, it's a, it is a lot of work to put this together and we wanna be sure that it's of value to you. So thank you everybody who has provided feedback to us throughout the chat, uh, throughout the event in the chat and the comments and the emails. So important and so helpful for us. Thank you very much. and. Uh... We'll see you soon at Social Media Talk uh, 2. Bye bye. Thank you, you guys everyone. Are awesome. Thank you. Have, Have a, a nice great day. weekend. Thank you, guys.